One minute. Mm -hmm. She must be on the way. She must be on the way. Well, good morning and welcome to the uh, February 16th, 2024 Sandbag Transportation Committee meeting. Um, I will now uh, call the meeting to order. And before we move forward, I would like to ask the interpreter um, uh, to have us ask, let us know how to access the, the interpretation. Please go ahead. Good morning. Announcement from the interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please to scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are, click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app from a cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you're in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, donde está el globo terráqueo, y seleccione español. Si está utilizando la aplicación de, de mo, uh, móvil de Zoom desde su celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos y luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en el fondo, eh, en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione New Original Audio o silenciar audio original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación si se encuentra en la sala de la reunión. Favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to first um, do some uh, introductions of new members uh, to this committee. Uh, first from the uh, Port of San Diego, uh, we have uh, the alternate, which is Joe Nelson. Good seeing you here. Uh, and normally it would be... Uh, um, Frank Ertzen, uh, but um, who's the chair. And also I want to, uh, well, not introduce, but uh, let everyone know that the vice chair is Mayor Kranz from uh, Encinitas, and uh, look, counting on him to help me out uh, uh, throughout the year and, and many times through a lot of things that this committee is going through. And lastly, I'll let uh, Colleen introduce another member of the staff. What about the county where? I did last. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm... I'm I'm sorry, I missed one. Allison Snow, um, chair, council chair from Lemon Grove. Sorry. Welcome, new members. Um, at your last meeting, I think you all thanked Brian Lane for his role serving as the staff committee coordinator to the transportation committee. And I wanted to introduce you all to Grace Mino, who was taking over that role from Brian. And Grace has been with Sandag just as long as I have. And she and I were just talking about it. We realized we started on the very first day. Yeah, or we had our very first day, July 11th, 2005 together. So we just found that out. But anyway, Grace is a great asset to Sandag. She's headed up um, a lot of work in the research area. She's an expert on surveys, and we're really happy to have her in this role serving all of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next, next, let me have um, our clerk, Francesca Webb, uh, to confirm that we have a quorum and roll call. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, I can confirm we do have a quorum, but we'll go through the roll call as well. For the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Mayor Sanchez. Present. And Rafael Perez. Here. For the City of San Diego, Councilmember Campillo. Here. For the County of San Diego, Supervisor Montgomery Stepp. Here. For East County, Chair Shu. Here. And Councilmember Snow. Here. For Metropolitan Transit System, Councilmember Moreno. Present. For North County Coastal, Mayor Kranz. Here. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Kranz. Uh, and Councilmember Zito. Present. For North County Inland, Mayor White. Present. And Councilmember Musgrove. Here. For North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Edson. <clears throat> Present. For the Port of San Diego, Job Nelson. Here. And for South County Councilmember Duncan. Present. Uh, and for Caltrans, uh, Director Townsend. Here. And Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, Chairwoman Pinto. Present. And that concludes the roll call. And uh, as I stated before, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, we'll go on to public comment, but I don't want to make a statement first. Uh, we're able to hear uh, members of the public make comments, but as a reminder, uh, no comments shall be uh, loud, threatening, profane, or abusive, uh, using abusive language that disrupts, disrupts the orderly conduct of the meeting uh, will be tolerated. Any such language or any other disorderly conduct uh, that disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct uh, of the board meeting is prohibited. For board policy, the amount of time allowed for each uh, a verbal public comment is determined based on the number of uh, agenda items, the complexity of those items, and the members of the uh, of numbers of people um, anticipating to offer comments. Uh, this allows us to hear from as many people as possible and to complete our business while we are still have a quorum. Uh, based on those factors for today, this meeting, uh, each member of the public doing public comment will be allowed uh, two minutes to make, a, make comments. Um, the amount of time is at the discretion of the chair and depending on the number of uh, commenters, we make adjustments uh, to that. So, Ms. Francesca, please, uh, let's go on with public comments. Do we have any members of the public that wish to make a general comment? Thank you, Chair. I do. One member of the public would like to speak on this item, the original draw. You can go ahead. Always one member of the public. It's so sad. Um, I'm really impressed, Jack, um, for two minutes. Um, yeah, I, it's a little disturbing yesterday when I, or even before, Sandeg talks about how there's going to be less and less people um, and less children um, in, as time goes on until we get to 2050. Um, so it's a little bit terrifying to think about um, why that is, and it could be many factors, but it doesn't leave us with a really good, you know, hope of the future um, for more people. Um, but that's the plan too, is to depopulate. But um, as we sit here and we spend all this um, money from gas taxes on um infrastructure for biking and walking um, that's taking away the money that should be being spent on the that was promised to be spent on the roads and so through equity or for equity um, I would hope that you could look into some kind of fee for bikers or the people that are walking um, and using the transit because it's not fair to take away from the people who are driving and paying a tax that they believe is going into the infrastructure for the roads and have it you know, go to so many other things while the roads are suffering. Um, and then talk about, you know, actually charging possibly more fees um, in different ways to provide, you know, what's needed. And so if we weren't using the money to, you know, go towards different infrastructure that it wasn't intended to be used for, the roads would be a lot, in a lot better condition than they are. I mean, especially after having storms and whatnot, that's going to come and make the roads even worse because of the conditions they were in weren't um, that great. And so it's, you know, we need to stop getting in our way and doing things that like, you can't promise something and, and have it be one way and then totally use it for something else and then demonize drivers, but want them to pay for all of the infrastructure. And as you're going to have less and less people using gas, you're going to have less of that to use. So it needs to be used for the roads. That concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you. Do we have any general comments from many uh, committee members? Uh, Mr. Townsend from Caltrans. 
Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, share with the committee that uh, Caltrans will be kicking off a multi-agency workshop uh, next week on the zero emission vehicle strategy for the states of California, Baja California, and Baja California Sur. It's part of the uh, Border Master Plan, uh, which is a binational comprehensive roadmap uh, between the U.S. and Mexico uh, to address planning and delivery of transportation infrastructure and investments along the border. So uh, just wanted to share with that uh, the committee, this is going to be kicking off next week. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from any, Ms. Pinto? Thank you, Chair Shu. First, I wanna appreciate the comments that you made in the beginning about uh, setting the stage for the meetings going forward. I appreciate that. Um, myself and many other tribal leaders attended a missing and murdered indigenous persons um, second annual summit in Sacramento this week where we um, addressed the issue. We lobbied a lot of the assembly and senators on the issue um, to, wait, to raise awareness and to make some policies that will protect our people. Um, second of all, we have a technical working group on February 28th at Viejas. It's in person. So that's coming up. And then we have a Native American Advisory Committee to Caltrans coming up on um, March 13th, 2024. I just want to make those announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Any other comments from board members? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let's go on to item number one on the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I already did that. So let's move on to um, uh, consent on, uh, items. Uh, unless any members of the board would like to pull an item, we can go on with the consent um, items. Uh, is there anyone that wants to clear uh, pull any items from the consent calendar? No one. Then I want to make a quick comment on the consent calendar. Is a report with regards to um, uh, safety issues, and um, and this is just a side comment. Uh, the Department of Transportation um, has an old rating scale, which is a number of accidents per hundred uh, million. Uh, vehicle miles traveled. So uh, I hope in the future that we can change that so that we just deal with um, accidents and deaths on highways because we're going to be reducing vehicle miles traveled. And as we reduce vehicle miles traveled, that's we have better matrix that, to use rather than presuming that VMT is always going to increase uh, and that we have to use a uh, matrix based on uh, number of miles traveled. Um, uh, with that, I'll entertain a... Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have any public comments on the consent calendar. Thank you, Chair. We do have one public comment. The original draw, you can go ahead. Of course you do, Jack. Um, yes, so with the minutes, um, you're doing value capture, and I um, you know, I think we need to be really careful in doing that because you're going to be displacing more people, and when you have these growth incentive programs and we're working on all of this density, it does push people out um, of their own communities when we're doing that, and um, you know, we talk about not displacing people, but a lot of the things that you're doing is actually causing that to happen, especially when you're value capturing and the property values go up because you are going to purchase it and go put a bunch of density there. It's going to affect all of the people around there. Um, and um, so I think we need to be mindful of that. And then the performance management rule one safety target setting. I know you want to reduce fatalities. I mean, even if people aren't driving, there's still going to be um, fatalities because we have it with bikers and, you know, um, other modes of transportation that happen anyway. But I don't understand why when you want to deal with safety and you want to um, stop fatalities or serious injuries, why we're still pushing for the electric vehicles, which are lithium bombs, which are very dangerous. They also emit a lot of radiation, as does all of that infrastructure. Um, it's electromagnetic frequency. It's it's a radiation poisoning, which can give you loss of smell, sm um, smell and taste. And um, it it's it's similar to the flu and all those um, the COVID symptoms. And I've told you before, like whenever they they put out. Um, all of the 5G towers, which also emit radiation um, in all of those areas was the outbreaks for COVID in the United States. And so, you know, I know you guys don't want to look into that kind of stuff, but when you talk about safety, you know, we need to really be doing our due diligence to make sure that we're not putting people in danger by 
um, encouraging to get a specific type of vehicle that will potentially blow up, um, especially if they are in an accident. Um, and they can also, because they're autonomous, they can, they've been taking over people's driving and just driving them almost like a hundred miles an hour down the road. So it's, it's very dangerous and we need to look into that. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do we have any last minute comments from any board uh, committee members? If, if not, I entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar. From Sanchez, move approval. Moved by Sanchez and second by uh, Edson. Okay, so if we have uh, a motion by Sanchez and a second by Edson, let's please go. Uh, that motion does pass unanimously. Um, we'll have to correct the clicker for the Port of San Diego, but we'll make sure that we update that. Yeah. Our... Should we get a verbal? Um, Mr. Nelson, if you wouldn't mind just stating your vote for the record. Thank you very much. And we'll get you a button in just a moment. She shouldn't say it passed. Okay, so the motion passed. Um, we'll go on to um, item number four. Um, so Michelle and Naomi, who are here uh, to, uh, to ask, well, I'm, let me start over here. We'll go on to number four. Michelle and Naomi are here to ask us to recommend um, to the board of directors to approve the FY 2025 and 20 to 2029 estimates uh, and appointments uh, uh, for the Transportation Development Act, Federal Transit Administration and Trans Transnet funds. Sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Good morning, Chair and Committee members. Uh, this item prevents the present, provides the short-term revenue forecast that is brought to the Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee, Transportation Committee, and the Board of Directors of February of every year. This report provides revenue estimates for three types of funding the Transportation Development Act, or TDA, the Federal Transit Administration, or FTA funds, and the Transnet Sales Tax Measure funds. For FY 2025, the Transnet estimate is approximately $434 million and reflects an estimated growth rate of approximately 1% anticipated revenues over FY 2024. The TDA estimate for FY25 is approximately $205.7 million and reflects a similar growth as confirmed by the County of San Diego. The FTA estimates for FY25 is approximately $164 million. The various funding programs included in this forecast can be found in more detail in attachment one of your report, starting on page three of the report or 22 on your tablets. Attachment two, starting on page five of the report or 25 of your tablets, provides the forecast metho methodology conducted by staff to calculate these estimates. The forecast methodology includes quarterly data and relies on three independent nationally recognized forecasts in conjunction with the San Diego Regional Population Growth or SANDAG. This forecast also went through a peer review process or PRP in December of 2023 to review and concur with this methodology. Further information on economic conditions can be found in this attachment. And I also have Naomi Young, our principal economic research analyst here for any additional questions. Attachment three, starting on page 29 of your iPad, provides the breakdown of the revenue estimates for TDA and transnet funding. These estimates are then utilized by local and transit agencies to plan for capital projects and determine operating subsidies. You'll also note that for each fund type, we include how much funding flows to the various subprograms. For example, in attachment three on page 30 of your electric document, we include the proposed transnet allocation for programs such as administration, ITOC, bike ped, and the sub-programs for major corridor, transit, and local streets and roads. Upon board approval, the transit operators would receive $68 million for transit system improvements, and the local jurisdictions would receive $137 million for local streets and roads improvements. 
Some items related to this will, you will see in the upcoming months include the Transit Agency Capital Budgets and SANDAG's Draft 2025 Program Budget, which is scheduled to be presented next month. Also, local agencies' capital improvement programs will be updated, which will be reflected in future RTIP amendments. The ITOC reviewed this item at their meeting on February 14th and had no comments. Therefore, the Transportation Committee is asked to recommend that the Board of Directors approve the FY 2025 to FY 2029 estimates and apportionments for the Transportation Development Act, Federal Transit Administration, and Transnet funds. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Francesca. Do we have any comments that directly relates to this item? Thank you, Chair. We do have one public commenter at the original draw. You can go ahead. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but yeah, with all of the projected, um, you know, forecast of all the deficit, it's a concern to think about a bunch of these projects that will go underfunded um, because money's being taken out of many of these, um, uh, you know, pools to do the things that we need to do. And so, you know, I don't think we need to think about asking people to pay more fees, but, um, you know, we need to do something to keep up the roads and whatnot, especially with the storms that have come, um, like I said before, because, um, but we need to recognize why those storms came. I actually sent you guys an email to the clerk with information on the cloud seeding events that have taken place, because that's going to affect all of the infrastructure that you're set out to, um, you know, work on and, and fund and, and do different things with. Um, but if we don't pay attention that there's weather warfare going on and that these storms are going to continue because they're man-made, um, it's going to be a waste of all the money spent if we can't um, stop that. And you guys could legislate for a ban on weather modification to make sure that all of the money that is spent is not going to waste. And, you know, it's the people who work really hard for the money that they um, give you guys to <clears throat> basically do what needs to be done to make sure that things are um, kept up in a decent amount of time and in, in, in a reasonable manner. But there's been a lot of negligence happening with the money spending. And so as there's um, major deficits that we're facing, you know, it's kind of just uh, the state of, of the county is left kind of in peril of most of the time. And it's just kind of sad to think about that we people spend so much money towards all of these things to get them fixed. And um, the, it just falls to the wayside and, and nothing gets done in, a, you know, a timely manner and, and the way it should be. Money is actually spent to take care of all of the upkeep and it doesn't go towards that. And it'll be years before it is. So we need to be better. That concludes the public comments. Uh, thank you. Do we have any member comments and questions? If not, I would entertain a motion to uh, move a staff recommendation. To, uh... So moved by Sanchez. Sanchez moves. Second by Edson. And second by Edson. Any other last, any other comments? If not, we can go ahead and vote. Uh, move, move by Sanchez and second by Edson. That motion passed unanimously. Thanks. Let's move on to item number five. Uh, Morella and Tara are uh, here to present uh, on the San Diego and Imperial County's sustainable freight and implementation strategy. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, Chair Shu and members of the Transportation Committee. Uh, my name is Mariela Rodriguez, a Senior Regional Planner with the Strategic, strategic Partnerships Team uh, here in the Planning Department. Uh, today, I'm here with uh, Tara Lake from WSP uh, to provide an update on the San Diego and Imperial County Sustainable Freight Implementation Strategy. Um, I last presented this item here in May, and at the time uh, we went over uh, the outreach efforts that we conducted throughout the project uh, since it started two years ago. 
Um, we also discussed the evaluation criteria, the screening criteria, and discussed a lot of the different uh, projects and locations that we were evaluating. Uh, today, uh, we want to uh, share the progress that we have made on the pro on the project as we near the ending of it. Uh, so to provide a background and the reason for this project, uh, freight is an essential part of our regional economy and plays a significant role in our lives. And that was very clear during the uh, pandemic when we had a lot of disruption in the supply chain. Um, we also know we know that uh, communities near and around uh, freight facilities bear a, a disproportionate burden uh, when it comes to air quality, pollution, noise, and other environmental issues. So to address some of these issues, uh, SANDAG, the Imperial Transportation, the Imperial County Transportation Commission, and Caltrans have been developing this strategy. Uh, the plan intends to create a more sustainable supply chain network through regional freight projects and policies that reduce emission while fostering trade. So over the project, the team has been engaging in, in numerous um, outreach efforts to inform what folks around the region um, think would be the best for both counties, Imperial and San Diego County. Uh, we conducted stakeholder interviews, numerous focus groups, a public survey, did a lot of presentations and heard from a lot of different folks. Um, our team incorporated the feedback received into the project's prioritization to identify the key strategies. So Tara will now discuss some of the key strategies and the fact sheets that we developed, which were linked to the agenda. Thank you. Hi, Tara Lake with WSP, Senior Vice President and uh, Director for Southern California. As Mariel said, we really kind of dove deeper into some representative projects throughout uh, the region. And that really kind of sets us up for the implementation and also to go after grant funding. So the, what we looked at uh, for these key strategies, can't, sorry, key strategies are you know, what, what are the benefits um, of these projects, programs, and policies? How much is it going to cost? What are some funding opportunities and sources? Um, also, what's the timeline from kind of beginning to end? And what are some challenges and considerations uh, that we might might face? So some of the projects that we uh, developed these key uh, strategy fact sheets for are truck only lanes, grade separations, rest area parking and amenities, wireless inductive charging, zero emission truck charging and parking areas. And in these fact sheets, we have detailed um, benefits and consideration challenges, but these are some of the overarching for all of those projects and that are, you know, to reduce greenhouse gas and other air pollutants, um, reduce uh, truck traffic in neighborhoods, improve the safety and efficiency um, and productivity, and also lessen uh, the, uh, environmental impacts and mitigate those impacts. And some considerations and challenges uh, to look at um, or to, to contemplate are ongoing operations and maintenance, uh, multi-stakeholder coordination. As we know, there's uh, oftentimes many different uh, jurisdictions involved as well as agencies um, that upfront cost and those impacts to the adjoining uh, neighbors and properties and local infrastructure. So then we also looked at programs and those that we uh, looked at as representative examples are cargo bike incentives, private truck parking development, and dynamic curb regulation. And some of those overarching benefits are, again, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, re uh, decreasing the truck traffic in our vulnerable communities, uh, improving the safety, productivity, and uh, network efficiency, um, and also reducing environmental impacts. Some considerations and challenges are, um, again, identifying the funding sources, but also obtaining the approval for these incentives. Um, most of these will be working with local jurisdictions, so of course, obtaining that support, 
and then potentially some policy hurdles um, and changing local regulations. And then, of course, addressing business concerns. Um, they may be concerned, of course, that some of this might negatively impact their businesses, um, but that's usually not the case, but getting over that, that hurdle and those, those initial concerns um, impacts the adjacent properties and, and local roads and infrastructure. And then lastly, we delved deeper into some policies. We looked at overweight truck route planning, low emission zones, and land use compatibility. And so the benefits are, you'll see a theme with all of these as you know, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, of course, to meet the climate goals of the region, as well as the state, um, uh, reducing that congestion in our, in our neighborhoods from freight traffic, um, stimulating the adoption of cleaner transportation technologies. This really could be a, a synergistic uh, step. Considerations and challenges are, um, Again, identifying funding sources, um, ensuring that widespread compliance, these types of policies kind of only work if, if, uh, if, if, if everyone participates, um, and also what are the economic impacts. And so that, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Mariella. Thank you, Tara. Uh, so the last component of the study is the Workforce Development Toolkit, where we did a market analysis to provide a snapshot on how job postings and applicant profiles compare and identified uh, what type of uh, skill gaps exist between what is needed and what is available in the current workforce. Um, we also did an inventory of available training programs in San Diego and Imperial County. Uh, and in the surrounding areas, which includes the uh, LA County, uh, Orange County, and in the Inland Empire, as well as the universities in, in uh, Baja California. And then we develop recommendations on how to meet this, the needs for the emerging and new technologies uh, as they evolve. Um, and then, um, so that includes yeah, inc continuing to do market analysis and monitor trends uh, and gaps. Um, and then another recommendation is to work with employers to develop employee specific, employer specific training programs that can be da done by um, developing training models that can be inserted into existing programs or into new programs. Uh, and then having more ongoing regional conversations uh, to highlight the workforce needs and taking actions uh, to address them. And that could include creating a committee um, at the regional level where uh, public agencies, educational organizations, and uh, employers and other stakeholders participate to continue uh, this conversation figure out the different gaps that exist and address those. Uh, so our, our analysis is uh, setting a foundation for understanding the workforce landscape today and more additional uh, studies and analysis need to continue to um, evolve as the, um, as the needs change. Uh, so here is an example uh, of a certificate structure that has been developed uh, from the California uh, Sustainable Freight Action Plan. Uh, it's called the Sustainable Freight Certificate. So next steps, um, we are now working on finalizing the final comprehensive strategy uh, report um, with the work completed today, which includes existing conditions assessment, innovative strategies development and screening, uh, the fact sheets that Tara went over and the workforce development toolkit. Uh, this final com report uh, will be completed by the end of this month and uh, we plan to continue to pursue funding opportunities for some of the projects in the future and continue to engage with other agencies to move some strategies to implementation. Um, as it is, we are currently um, participating on the zero emission infrastructure uh, for trucks, which is a Caltrans-led uh, feasibility study. <clears throat> and me and the rest of my, our team is uh, participating on that study. That's one example. 
So here's our contact information, myself, Tara Lake, Tim Garrett, uh, who has also been involved in the project uh, from the beginning. And I wanted to also acknowledge Jose uh, Marquez Chavez from Caltrans, who has been part of the project development team uh, since the project started. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the chair. Thank you for your time, and we welcome any questions. Thank you, Darren and uh, Mariella. Um, do we have any public comments, Francisco? Thank you, Chair. Um, Tim Bailish, if you'd like to step up to the podium, you'll be first, and Tim will be followed by the original draw. Good morning, Transportation Committee. Dr. Timothy Bailash up in Del Mar. I am a candidate for Congress 50, and I speak as such today. I want to note, and I thank, first of all, thank you for this report. Um, I want to note in figure two, some things that stick out to me. The interurban and rural bus transportation occupation numbers change and the rail transportation number changes. Those are the only things that are in the negative direction for San Diego and Imperial County. Um, this, so I wonder, does that mean that we're changing our emphasis from rail and more um, climate and efficient and cost-effective transportation here in San Diego and increasing our emphasis on um, trucks and then building more roads. So that's something that sticks out to me. I wanted to also mention in figure one, I saw that there apparently uh, has been a huge demand for program managers. And my understanding is in engineering, especially in these kind of civil projects, that program managers need to be seasoned. And we've had a flight of many of these senior people from organizations, including Sandag. So I just wanted to bring those two things to attention. Thank you for all your efforts. I think our next speaker will be the original draw, who will be followed by Christina Marquez. So I'm wondering, because none of this infrastructure actually saves GHGs, but you're not actually creating it here. And so I'm wondering if that's why you don't really care about the amount that it's caused. I mean, because you have to have a oil to make all this stuff and, um, you know, the lithium, I mean, in, in mining and, and whatnot, you can't just go and, I mean, children can dig for it. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I just don't understand when you're sitting here. I mean, good to put more truck lanes. That's nice. But when you're talking about doing electric um, freight. I don't know if when you're doing your studies, you're going and talking to all of these drivers, especially even um, owner operators. But I mean, this is going to significantly change the way that they, you know, travel and do their job because it's not going to be able to be the same anymore. And the amount of weight that is going to be added to these vehicles, these trucks will severely impede the amount of freight that can be transported. So, I mean, as you sit here and, in, 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 you know, I mean, even just with the weather, um, you know, you're not going to get as much distance. It significantly de decreases. Um, salt water affects these batteries. They're combustible, um, you know, just from the fumes. So, I mean, you're actually, like I've said, put, pe putting people in danger, especially with the radiation um, poisoning that would come from a wireless charging device or even when they hook it up, especially when they hook it up. So... You know, it's it's if you're not talking to these um, drivers and these companies, um, you could significantly lose a lot of freight because these people aren't going to want to play this game and have to do all of the waiting around to charge these. Because how long is it going to take to charge one of these vehicles? I mean, they have a 10 hour rest period that they have to take all the time. But, you know, is it going to be within that amount of time or is it going to be that you have to have like three drivers or I don't know, put solar on top so that you can continue to charge it. I mean, it's it's this is significantly going to impede freight. It's not good. Our next speaker will be Christina Marquez, who will be followed by Jane Stevenson. Good morning, Honorable Board. Christina Marquez, representing 3,600 union electricians with IBEW Local 569. First of all, thank you for putting this together. This is uh, very involved and I appreciate you involving us uh, with uh, the stakeholders meeting. Um, so we definitely need to focus on um, the getting that people mover in. 
from the airport, that's priority. I know that's not part of freight, but that's that's a priority. Now, when it comes to freight, um, you guys know that in Imperial Valley, they have what they call lithium gold. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that want that to go to Los Angeles and Riverside. We need to make sure that it comes here as well, but we need to make sure that it's done uh, not to increase GHG or VMT. We need to make sure that it's done with uh, freight, electric freight, um, whether that be electric rail uh, or hydrogen rail, uh, and then electric uh, trucks. Um, also, when it comes to that, any installation for electric charging stations, we need to make sure whether it's a, a, you know, installation for a class two charging station, for a electric tugboat, for an electric um, anything. It needs to have the requirement of using the electric vehicle infrastructure training program or EVITP installed by uh, trained electricians. Um, and then also um, ensuring that, um, you know, we benefit from this in San Diego not just uh, the others that have the, the rail that's already established. Um, so thank you. Look forward to working with all of you in the coming days. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jane Stevenson and Jane will be our final speaker on this item. Hi there, good morning. Um, my name is Jane Stevenson. I'm with the environmental nonprofit Pacific Environment. We are focused on getting ships off of fossil fuels as soon as possible and have a consultative status with the International Maritime Organization. I just want to emphasize the importance of addressing in this strategy uh, the immense pollution that comes from ships in California and at the ports such as Port of San Diego. You know, the, the key strategies and programs and policies presented today were focused a lot on trucks, which are very important, but you know, ships are a really large source of toxic and criteria air pollutants, as well as climate pollutants. And as California works to implement some of its regulations addressing um, other sources of mobile mobile source pollution, such as the advanced clean cleats role, we're going to see the proportion of remaining pollution uh, from ships grow even bigger. And so it's really important that we're addressing the, the ship and port pollution. So I just wanna urge you know, the board in finalizing the strategy to make sure that um, there are key strategies focused around um, ship and port pollution and the effects that they have on um, port adjacent communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our public comments on this item. Great. Any uh, questions or comments from uh, committee members? Councilman Moreno. Thank you for the presentation. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Vivian Moreno. I'm a council member in the city of San Diego. Um, I happen to represent the Otay Mesa Port of Entry, which is the second most um, important commercial crossing of the nation. Um, and I, I was a little confused by this presentation. Um, this freight implementation strategy, this is something that is required of us. Is this why we're conducting this? Uh, it's not a requirement, uh, but because of the new regulations to transition to zero emission and uh, all the regulations as far as like the environment and reducing emissions and GHG, uh, we thought it was uh, proper to do a study that was comprehensive uh, with strategies that we can implement into the future to be responsive to those regulations. Uh, yeah. And so where we are right now is you've went out to the stakeholders and you're cobbling together information. Is that correct? So we have been developing the project for the last two years and we are nearing the end of it. Uh, over the course of these two years, we met with a lot of stakeholders and conducted a lot of outreach to gather information from everybody and that informed our projects. Okay. And can you um, go into the projects? Can you elaborate on some of the projects? So we have a list of over 200 projects in the strategies and Tara um, cover, uh, I don't know if the presentation is 
Okay. So these are the um, key projects that we are going to be pursuing. Uh, but there are a lot of different projects, and we cover those uh, in greater detail at the last presentation that we did for TC in May. Uh, I don't have all the list uh, with me right now, uh, but I can definitely send that information to you. Okay, thank you. And then also in regards to the policies, do you have, um, I know you you had a slide as well of the policies that you guys are looking into. Um, is there a more elaborate plan of policies? Yes, we have probably like 30 different policies, but these are like the ones that were rated higher. Okay, I think maybe I just need a, a briefing on this because I'm scratching my head just considering um, the difficulty I think that we're going to have in our region with um, juggling the fact that there is a plan by the state of California to lower, um, what is it, 2035? Yes. Um, and also there's almost no infrastructure currently in Otay Mesa, right? There's no more land. Land is really, really expensive. Um, and I won't even touch the port and, and 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 the land restraints that we have with the port um but i'm looking forward to to seeing this um come to fruition i commend you guys for uh, i commend sandag for for creating this document um on top of the land that we have to deal with um this is also a industry that's a very important industry uh we saw it how we saw the importance of this industry during covid um, and it's an industry that is very much linked to Mexico. Uh, we're, you know, we're almost one entity when it comes to uh, cross-border commerce. And I think people think of people shopping, but the amount of goods that go back and forth is just astounding. $50 billion of commerce and um, the trading partners that Mexico has, obviously California it, that's our number one trading partner um, on top of the other states in the nation that Mexico and Baja are trading partners with. So um, a very delicate um, industry. And um, I commend you guys for for grabbing the bull by the horn and, and figuring it out. Um, and um, as I stated, I think I probably should get a more in-depth uh, briefing on this matter because it's one that affects my community. And really, it affects all of our communities. But it impacts my community on top of the air quality, obviously, of our residents, which is um, very important. But thank you. Um, we are not receiving this document report, right? We're just it's just, just informational. Wonderful. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate it. Councilman Duncan. Thank you. Just a few follow-up questions to Councilmember Marino's comments. The this study, did you say it started two years ago? Correct. And I think it was funded from a half a million dollar grant. Is that correct? It was, yes. So is that is that money completely spent or so we're done with that? Well, it's going to be spent by the end of this month, yes. Okay, and that's when the policy is going to come out or the final report? It's, yeah, the final report. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm looking through um, the fact sheet, the summary fact sheet for key strategies, which is giving me some more information or I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. So can we put those five projects back up? I just wanna, uh, thank you. These five projects. So I just, to be clear, none of these five projects are funded yet. Is that correct? They are not. So okay. the, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. Um, do we, in total, if we just did these five projects, do you have a an estimate on what these five projects would cost? So I would need to, pull, do you have the uh, fact sheet? Yeah, we have some estimates in the fact sheets themselves. So I would have to kind of do the math and add them all up, but but that information isn't there. Was, were the fact sheets attached? But yes. we, okay. yeah. Okay, no, I do see some of it here. For instance, just for the, 
for, I don't see it on that one though, but it has a railroad roadway grade separation of 150, 200 million. Some of the other ones are five, 10, 15. And it looks like, so after this, I just wanna make sure this is my last question. After this uh, report at the end of the month, the next thing, if I'm looking at this milestone, would be some type of conceptual planning study or project study that would take another 12 to 18 months before preliminary design would start? Well, we would need to first pursue funding to fund these projects and then do a more detailed analysis of each of those projects. Okay. Do you, last question, I guess, sorry, I have one more. Um, if things go as fast as you think they can go, what is your estimate on when this plan would be implemented timeline wise? Well, it depends on the type of projects that we're gonna be pursuing. Like I said, there are a lot of different projects and uh, that has to do with the prioritization of the region, the agency uh, prioritizations. And I don't know if uh, you wanna say something. Hard to okay. If I may, um, so just to, to respond and thank you both for your comments. So this strategy is really in response to all the laws that have been changing and then how goods movement impacts this region, both from an economic perspective and from the environmental greenhouse gas perspective. So all of this, there are multiple studies that we do that then feed into the 2025 regional plan. So these are the kinds of projects when we talk about a grade separation project, that's the kind of project that then is in the regional plan. So it's through that big picture document, then we look at what are the opportunities for funding these. <laughs> So these kinds of projects have to be in the plan before we can actually go for funding. Just like everything else that's in the regional plan, then we have to do further studies to refine exactly what would that grade separation look like. If we're doing truck only lanes, how would those be incorporated say with managed lanes within our system? So that further analysis happens. I do believe that we're in a good um, position as a region to apply for grant funds to help implement these kinds of projects because of the economic value as well as the environmental value. So we're going to continue to incorporate this into all of the work that we do here. So hopefully that answers the questions. We're happy to do individual briefings on more specifics. Uh, Vice Chair Thank you. I appreciate the report. In uh, the days of my youth, I actually drove trucks. So um, it wasn't the 18 wheelers, but I delivered house plants to LA from San Diego um, several days a week. Um, and so uh, seeing the efforts that are being made to address the impacts of truck traffic on our region is important, especially as it relates to diesel particulate matter that is spewed from these trucks uh, every day, almost 24 hours a day, especially through Encinitas. Not that they turn it up in Encinitas, it's the same amount that goes through Carlsbad, Oceanside, Solana Beach. Um, so working towards those bottom two uh, projects is pretty, pretty important from where I sit. Um, I also appreciate the notion of uh, developing a workforce, um, good, High paying jobs are important. Um, and I, you know, I know that the Teamsters are involved. These are some union jobs. Um, so it is um, something that I think is important to uh, keep Sandeg um, looking at and planning for. The other uh, main point that I wanted to make is that there is Assembly Bill 2286 that is uh, um, proposing to mandate. Uh, an operator in autonomous vehicles. And uh, while I don't know much about the bill, it's my hope that um, our legislative policy um, includes the ability to weigh in on that particular effort and uh, that we could at one point perhaps review and uh, help and egg formulate a position on that legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Clarence. Any other? Councilman Member, yeah. Council Member, yeah. Council Member, yeah. Um, the only project that I could think of that has come close uh, to any of these projects is um, the Harbor Drive 2.0 that the port is uh, pursuing right now, uh, right next to Barrio Logan. It's not only a 
truck only lane. Uh, there are many components to that project, um, but it, we're very happy about that, about the truck lane. Uh, so that's the only thing I could think of. And it's obviously the, the amount of money that it's gonna cost is very high. Once again, it's not only a truck lane and it's it's a city lane, but I think Harbor Drive used to be more of a regional highway, um, whatever, 50 years ago or whatever. I just wanted to point that out, that there is one occurring as we speak. And Joe, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. And thank you. You were stealing my thunder. I was actually getting ready to talk about Harbor Drive 2.0 because it's very exciting. I want to thank Sandag for this work. This is really, really important and was mentioned earlier um, the state has very aggressive goals in terms of 2035, and with our maritime clean air strategy, we even have more aggressive goals, right? We're trying to transition our trucks, 100% of our drayage trucks to electric by 2030. And so that means we have very little time to get some of this stuff done. Um, and so I'll talk in just a second about the important pieces of that. But I, I do thank you for mentioning um, Harbor Drive 2.0 because we just had a vote on Tuesday. Um, and actually, Sandag came and presented in partnership with us, um, where, where our board voted for $2.2 million to match the $18 million in TSEP funding from the state to finish up the full design, to finish up the right-of-way pieces that need to be done so that we can pursue uh, federal grant money this year um, in the form of raise grants to be able to fund that project. Um, that project costs have gone up, um, but it's gone up for good reasons, right? One of the things that we're realizing is when we originally were pricing it out, um, we weren't thinking about the fact that we needed heavyweight concrete to be able to handle the heavyweight uh, heavy weights of those trucks that are coming through. Battery power trucks are just heavier. Um, the other thing is the inductive charging, right? Making sure that we're including that in the project or at least have the ability to do that. If we're building it, we might as well build it in right from the beginning and that ups the cost. Um, but it's exciting. And as you look up here um, on it, the wireless inductive charging, the the benefits to the community, and it, by the way, it's not just about trucks, um, but it uses intelligent transportation systems to move those trucks with queue jumping, things like that. So they're out and they're, one, it's encouraging trucks to stay out of the neighborhoods, but it's also moving them through really quickly. So there's not that additional pollution for the few that are still in the future going to be using diesel. Um, the, the two things that we really have to be thinking about our regional charging, right? We're in the process of right now trying to, because you're absolutely right, land is really valuable. We've set aside some of our land. We're negotiating right now on an electric charging station on some of our, our property, but that's great for the first, you know, 100 miles. But once they get beyond our borders, they're going to need other places to plug into and charge because right now the charge on those trucks is about 150 to 200 miles. So they're going to need additional charging along the way. And so we really need to be thinking about that charging infrastructure. The second piece that really becomes important and was mentioned by the team is the ability to handle the heavy weights. Um, you know, we're building Harbor Drive so we can handle it, but we're already seeing a little bit of a pushback from some of our member cities. And I understand completely. They're sitting there saying, well, what about once it leaves Harbor Drive, that last little bit before it gets on the freeway, who's gonna pay for the wear and tear on the roads, right? And we're talking to Caltrans about how do we actually even get heavyweight <clears throat> permits to be able to allow these things because they're gonna bust the permits in terms of heavyweight, heavy duty trucks. So those are things that we have to be thinking about and we have to be thinking about and Caltrans has been great with us in terms of talking about that. But we have to be accelerating these things really quickly because 2030, uh, no, I'm going to use the pun, is coming at us like a freight train, right? And so we need to be able to address these things quickly. So this kind of study sets the stage, but we need to be prepared as soon as this report comes out to really get serious about it and think about it and prioritize these things because passenger vehicles are only one half of this equation. Goods movement is too important and we need to th be thinking about it in the future. Any other comments from any, oh, uh, Mayor Sanchez. Thank you very much, and um, I, I'm so um, I'm so glad that part of the strategy strategies include uh, drive the um, driving or parking in vulnerable neighborhoods, um, especially in, in terms of this transition, um, because uh, it does seem like, especially in, in um, North County and other places, of course, it does uh, feel like most of the trucks um, end up either stopping as a rest stop. Um, or um, driving through as if there's a it's a, it's a um, shortcut to their final destination. 
Um, so I'm really, really glad that is included. Um, certainly the idea of the current rest stops being equipped with um, charging stations and um, and other things to attract them more to the, the, the rest stops. I don't know if there's um, a property that is still, still owned by Caltrans where they could actually create more places where they can rest um, and also charge. Um, and uh, some other things, amenities that might keep them alert in, in traveling, you know, continuing with the travel. So some of these trucks go um, through our borders, but then through other states. So I, I think this is a really critical thing that, to, that we're studying and um, hoping to have this also, um, you know, uh, give information to other agencies involved. Thank you. Right, those, um, Caltrans, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, this this grant was initiated by Caltrans, which uh, Sandag and uh, the, the region basically won. And so Caltrans is very supportive of this effort. Uh, we're continuing to work with, uh, with Sandag and Imperial Valley. Uh, we recognize there are still a lot of challenges that we need to resolve, but uh, for any briefings, I think that may be uh, needed to to get a little further into uh, into what we're striving to achieve. Uh, we'll be glad to to participate in that. Uh, so I just want to make that available to anyone who's interested. Thank you, Mr. Townsend. Sure. If not any other comments, I have a short list, but I don't want us to stay here for too long. And you don't need to answer all these items, but I just want to point out uh, some issues. Uh, first, at uh, the Sandag Board. Uh, a few years ago, uh, passed a resolution with regards to equity. And I think that's important when we deal with uh, environmental justice. And we know this is an environmental justice issue that um, certain communities, uh, communities of color and poor communities suffer uh, a, a disproportionate amount uh, from uh, this pollution. Uh, the other is that uh, the Sandag Board did pass a resolution with regards to reducing health impacts in the regional plan. And this information can really be helpful uh, in that regard. So we need to start modeling, I hope, uh, a reduction in health impacts, particularly in these communities. And then the other is, uh, I'm glad the, the port, the, uh, is, uh, Job uh, mentioned uh, what the port is working on, uh, because we have maritime plans. We have another cert from uh, AB 617, which gives us another goal in other port side communities, as well as the border communities and Isidro and other communities uh, with a steep goal of 80% reduction by 2031. That's right around the corner. Uh, and I'm glad uh, that we have, we're working with stakeholders for the last two years. Uh, so uh, there's a lot going on and I hope uh, Sandy I can help provide information uh, with these strategies so we can implement them. Um, I have some concerns. I'm worried that, that uh, truck only lanes uh, will actually um, create a great lane for trucks, uh, but actually uh, create another lane for other vehicles and induce demand. And we end up with even more pollution than before um, and, and not really dealing with our congestion problems. So that's something that I hope uh, Sandag uh, looks into that strategy as well. I, I know we may relieve congestion for two, three, four years, but the data shows that when you have an induced command situation, increase additional lanes, uh, it, it's a short-term solution, uh, and that we're back to where we were before in, in a number of years. Um, there's um, another, uh, one of your slides showed um, low emission zones, and I'm curious to know what that is and whether or not we can target uh, a reduction in emissions from those low emission zones and what are some of the strategies uh, that are uh, thought of with, with regards to reducing emissions in, in those zones. Yeah, so these are developing uh, zones where it's you know required to to drive slowly um, to you know so so that so that th that th the emissions are kept low in these areas. So there are some some examples, um, and I I can we have some experts that that can really speak to this, but um, but the, but this is a. Um, is a kind of community specific targeted area where where there are issues and you can really can kind of control it and and reduce the emissions there. Great. Does that include the tracking of uh, vehicles? The the port commission is starting to register all vehicles that go in and out of the ports. We don't have a better idea of, uh, of what these. Oh, 
who who are these what are these drugs what are the emission levels and how many trips they make uh, and then we can have some uh, uh, strategies to deal with that um, mayor sanchez and i uh, both serve on the air pollution control district there's funding uh, that we want to direct um, strategically uh, to reduce emissions specifically in those uh, port side communities. So, so I think we, we, we need those kind of strategies uh, and they may include um, not just monitoring of the trucks that go in and out, but a strategy to reduce um, the, the amount of traffic. And, and lastly, it's not just um, electrification, uh, it is also reduction of VMT and reduction of, of trucks. And I hope that is in the strategies. Uh, and there are some ways that we can do that. My example that I give to, to folks often is we used to have um, many, many um, vans and trucks uh, on uh, vans and buses that go through the airport trying to pick up people to go to rent a vehicle. And then someone figured out, well, you know, all the vehicle rental stations are in the same place. And now we have one bus that goes through the bu on the airport uh, picking up Passengers doesn't matter which company they're going to rent a vehicle from. We were able to reduce the number of uh, of uh, vehicles going through the the U at the, or the terminals at the airport. So, I, I think that's the kind of strategies that we need to employ to reduce costs for everyone, reduce emissions, and reduce VMT. Um, and I hope that's something that we think of. Particularly if we we're to prioritize, let's make a prioritize and do our pilot programs in those communities that are most affected. And we, we know what those are. Uh, we use that, those maps of diesel PM on, on our resolution uh, of those communities with 75% percent, uh, percentile higher. Um, then to me, that's where we should start uh, piloting. Uh, that includes communities from from Coronado to to Oceanside, to Encinitas, Escondido, uh, everyone here at this table at this podium are affected. La Mesa is affected uh, with uh, diesel PM uh, in the 75 percentile higher. So to me, that's where we should start uh, employing these strategies. So uh, thank you for your work. It's a great informational piece. Um, I probably threw out a lot more work, so we need another grant from Caltrans to uh, move forward. Thank, thank you, you so much. <clears throat> we'll move on to... Um, Item number six. Item number six, we have a panel discussion on transportation services for individuals uh, with disabilities. And we have uh, Jenny and Brian from Sandag. And um, we've had uh, actually the wrong staff mentioned in our agenda on, from MPS and NTCD. Uh, we have um, Mike uh, White, Weigrant. Sorry, Mike, uh, but you're doing the last name. And uh, Chris uh, Orlando from NT, uh, NCTC. Uh, Francesca, um, can you please make a note of that uh, change in the agenda? And we'll go ahead and start with this item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, Brian Lane, Senior Transit Planner. And I'll be um, working here with Jenny, Mike, and Chris. I think uh, Robert's also joining us from NCTD, who's an expert on paratransit at NCTD. But we're here, um, th this has been a long string of items that has come before you over the last couple of years. Just a reminder, uh, a few years ago, our TDA performance auditor had requested that um, we start looking for ways to dedicate funds to our CTSA, which is FACT, for their mobility management um, purposes, because, um, and as you'll see with our, our data through here, you know, they receive about $180,000, $190,000 historically just for that, and the rest they have to compete for. Last spring, when we brought our cycle um, 12 before you, um, FACT did not win a couple grants, and so you then requested that we come back um, with some options to fund ride fact services. And then in October, we came and presented. Um, Kind of had some options, but it was kind of vague, and you gave us further direction to work with MTS and NCTD, um, discuss with them um, their funding and possible options. And so we've done that, um, and so we'll be today presenting through item six, just kind of a high overview of specialized transportation. We hope that helps provide you with that context of, of what's going on in San Diego with specialized transportation from the grantee side that Jenny's team runs, and then from MTS and NCD side from, you know, what they're required to run with their paratransit services. Um, 
we'll stop at item six, answer questions just on that high level. Um, and then we'll move on to item seven, which we've kind of formulated a more in-depth discussion about facts, actual services and operating costs and budgets, and, and then the options that we've kind of developed. Um, and on that one, you'll see um, there's four options and um, we'll hope you discuss that and, and have some good ideas. Um, you'll be seeing a lot of pie charts today, a lot of data, um, bear with us. I think it will be helpful for you. Um, something I was thinking when I was prepping for this item was that, and Colleen, we've been talking about this and she's talked about that with you, is we wanna make the, we wanna grow the pie bigger. And so that's gonna be the common theme with this, I think in this item is, you know, we all wish we had more money, but we're trying to figure out what we can do with the limited money that we do have. Um, and just a reminder, you know, this was one of the questions I believe you asked is, you know, do we have a good understanding of, of what's going on in the region in terms of the growing um, number of seniors and of individuals with disabilities? And, you know, we do, we do know this and you've seen this over um, various meetings and charts, but, you know, the, the current estimate of disabled riders in, our, in the region is about 11% and that will continue to grow. We don't have good projections on that um, throughout through 2050, but we do have a good sense of our um, elderly, elderly population, and that is going to grow, um, you know, by 2050 um, to be up, upwards of 22% of the population. So we know the need is massive. And at the end of this presentation, Jenny's going to talk about our plans over the next couple of years to try and um, really understand what the needs are and what the gaps are um, and how we can maybe figure out some ways to um, address that. So I just wanna give a high level um, overview of the annual specialized transportation funding in the region. It, it's a little confusing and I hope some of these charts and, and, and graphs help illustrate this. One of the pots we do give out is through our transnet um, ordinance. And that includes both paratransit funds to MTS and NCTD, as well as the um, senior mini grant um, competitive process that we give out every couple of years in our cycles. The next big pot is the Transportation Development Act or TDA um, that we give out and included in that is the, the funds for the CTSA that we've um, started dedicating back in 2005 to FACT. We give out Section 5310 um, every two years with the Senior Mini Grant. Um, and that's about $2.7 million each year. And then most recently, um, Ben's group has been pro providing you updates and the call for projects on the Access for All. That's the Uber and Lyft um, uh, funds that we receive through the tax that every everyone pays when they take an Uber or Lyft. Um, this total is about $18.1 million a year. Um, you know, some of it's carved off to MTS and NCTD. Um, obviously through a lot of the, the things we do. You saw in Michelle's item earlier today, um, how we do those apportionments each year for some of these. This is just the pie chart on uh, the transnet paratransit funding that is directed towards MTS and NCTD each year. This is FY23's numbers. Um, MTS receives about 1.2 million and NCTD receives about 490,000. Generally when we give out some of these uh, various funds, either the transnet funds or the TDA funds, um, to MTS and NCTD, it's done on a population-based split, and it, you can see here the percents. That's purely based off the population um, splits in their service areas. And every couple of years, we revisit those populations um, numbers and revise that percent. I don't think the number has changed much, actually, historically um, over time. But when you see the 71, 29%, the reasoning for that is because of that population split. The other big pot that we give out again is that TDA Article 4.5 funding. Um, that is uh, community transit type funding and out of the TDA funds that you saw in Michelle's item earlier, um, we carve off 5% of all those TDA funds in the Article 4 and give it to the Article 4.5 for um, MTS and NCTD paratransit as well as that small portion for the CTSA dollars. Um, you'll see further in the item seven item, this is where we're looking to possibly, uh, some of the options provide um, changes in the percents on this one. And then I mentioned before, uh, Ben's group has the access for all program funding, our cycle one, uh, we gave out $2.5 million. Uh, FACT was the awardee on that through the competitive process. 
and Ben later this month or next month will be opening the cycle two um, call for projects and that's about $2.3 million. And that's essentially to provide wheelchair um, rides similar to Uber and Lyft because they couldn't do it historically. And that's why the PUC enacted the tax on them. Um, and also for just other riders who maybe can't easily use an Uber or Lyft and would prefer to have a vehicle um, that's uh, accessible to them. So just a high level that we're not gonna have a quiz on this chart, um, but it's just meant to show historically over the um, many years that we've been doing specialized transportation. Uh, I think this is since 2006, you can kind of get a sense of how a lot of our grantees have been awarded. Um, we have some inactive grantees who um, have come and gone over the years and they've received some funds, but you can see a lot of um, great grantees and nonprofits and cities have come through our system and giving out, um, we've given out funds to them. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Jenny, who's gonna do a deeper dive into our grantees. Thanks, Brian. So now that you've learned a little bit more about how specialized transportation services are funded, I wanna talk to you about who those providers are. So there's a lot of different agencies in this space that provide these services. And a few of them we've tried to showcase on this slide. Mostly the agencies are our two transit operators, the CTSA, private nonprofit organizations, private companies, um, and also our local jurisdictions. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna try and highlight where they have things in common versus where they do not. It's really important to keep note of the word specialized. This service is highly specialized. So you can't really do a cross comparison between providers or between types of service because there's a whole lot of variants. We've tried to simplify as much of that as we can in here, but you'll hear us talk about places where you can compare versus places that you can't. So there's really two different categories of providers. So first are those public providers and they accept requests from anybody in the public that is either older or disabled. So the map that we've shown here on this slide shows the service area of those public providers who just receive funding from us. There's obviously other providers that's in the space. This is just really highlighting what is funded through our STGP, our grant program. So who's included in here, in case you're curious, is the CTSA, our transit operators, Travelers Aid Society, and also Jewish Family Service. So what you'll note is that in every area of our region, there's at least two providers that are in this public space, and there's many places where there's three or more providers. So what it means is that there's multiple options that the public can use when they need a specialized transportation service. The other type of providers that we have are client-based. So these are providers who offer specialized transportation only to their clients. So these are either just seniors or just individuals with disabilities or their services to specific locations like a resource, a medical center, or an employment center, or something like that. So you'll notice that this service type has a lot more concentration in the urbanized area and the region. This is because a lot of our grantees in this space are utilizing our Section 5310 funding and that funding is restricted to the urbanized area. You'll also notice that there's a higher concentration out in East County. This is because a lot of our longtime grantees like Home of Guiding Hands, Sharp Healthcare Foundation, St. Madeline Sophie Center, all of these have centers that are in El Cajon. So they have a lot more of their services that are happening in that area. So I wanna talk a little bit about performance of our grantees. And as I mentioned earlier, you can't exactly compare one against the other because they're specialized. Um, so there are some nuances here, but I'll try and get there as much as I can for you. So first I wanna notice the, notice the newest uh, grant program that Brian mentioned, our Access for All. So this is those on-demand services like Uber and Lyft, but they're specifically targeted for individuals with disabilities, especially those that need a wheelchair accessible vehicle. That's the big gap that's missing in Uber and Lyft. So the program started last July, mm -hmm. um, and you'll notice on the chart on the left that over 6,800 individuals have been served, and about 64% of those needed that wheelchair accessible vehicle, so the larger majority. And then on the chart on the right, we've delivered about 11,000 trips, and that's about 47% that are wheelchair accessible. So a lot more to come on this program. There's only the first six months or so that are shown here, but we'll continue to bring updates to you. Um, and as 
as Brian mentioned, that call is going to go out either later this month or next month that'll keep this program moving. So now I want to talk about our more long-standing program that many people are more familiar with, the, the Specialized Transportation Grant Program, or the STGP. Uh, one of the lesser-known details about this program is the number of vehicles that we fund. So we have about 125 vehicles floating around in the region at any point in time, and those were funded partly through our grant program. And these are usually accessible minivans, or they can be those larger kind of cutaway buses that you've seen on the street. So what we're highlighting here is the number of vehicles that each grantee had in this period. That number fluctuates a little bit as vehicles are purchased or as older vehicles reach their use for life and they're removed from service from the program. It doesn't necessarily mean they're removed from service entirely. It just means for purposes of us for grant funding that they're removed, but a lot of them continue to be operated sometimes 10 years beyond that time frame if they're still in good operating order and everything is still functioning. So the agencies that have the highest number of vehicles that you see on here are usually those that either have a really large client base or they've got a really large service area. So once a vehicle's put into service, those grantees are reporting to us quarterly the number of one-way passenger trips that they're providing and the number of miles that those vehicles are being driven. So this slide highlights the total number of one-way passenger trips that each grantee has provided along with the number of miles. The takeaway on this slide, I know there's a lot going on here, is that the performance of the vehicle grantees is fairly consistent with the number of vehicles that they have. For example, a grantee that has more vehicles, of course, is going to have more one-way passenger trips and more miles. One-way passenger trips and mileage also vary by vehicle type and configuration, service area, and the type of population served, so either client-based or public. So it's not exactly a one-to-one -one comparison, but you can kind of look at the left side versus the right side and kind of give you a little bit of an idea there. In addition to the grants for vehicle purchases, the STGP also provides funding for operating and contracted transportation service, which results in those trips to the actual clients. As I mentioned earlier, those services are specialized to the needs of the client, so you can't always compare the method that's used. Um, so there's not exactly a direct comparison there. So what we've shown on this slide is the annual amount of funding that each grantee spent over the most recent 12-year period and the cost of each one-way passenger trip. Some of those agencies might have more than one grant. For example, they might have one funded through Section 5310 and one funded through Senior Mini. Regarding the funding per trip, uh, this amount varies because of the way that those services are provided. So some agencies directly provide transportation with their own employees or volunteers. Others might use taxi or Uber or Lyft or a contracted service provider. So the line that you see here in green, this is derived by div dividing the total amount expended by the number of trips that that agency provided. And you'll notice that some of our grantees had higher costs per trip during this time. This was due to issues like driver shortages, volunteer shortages, staff shortages, inflation, high gas prices, things like that. So we did come to you last February and kind of mentioned that these things were going on, um, just to kind of keep you up to date of what's happening on the grant programs. And a lot of our grantees use all sorts of different solutions to try and drive that cost down. So some of them increase their match, they do have other sources that they can provide. Um, some car charge their costs to others or others put in a trip cap, you know, limiting the number of rides that they could place to try and drive that cost down. And you'll notice that there isn't data on here specific to the transit operators. Um, they only receive funding through us for vehicles. So we don't have their data that's shown here, but they are going to talk about that in their portions of the presentation. So the chart on this slide shows the total number of one-way passenger trips that are provided by each of our grantees over the most recent year. Um, it's important to note that most of our grantees in this, per this portion of the program uh, receive funding from both of our sub-programs, so Senior Mini and Section 5310, which means that those grants are, are used to match each other. So one scope of work that's partially funded by one and partially funded by the other. Why this matters is that when those grantees report to us the number of trips that they're providing with their grant, we only count those trips once so that we're not double counting. 
Um, the other factor is that one-way passenger trips vary by the size of the fleet, the service area, the vehicle type, the configuration, the funding amount, and their population served, so the client base versus public. Uh, the limited trips that were experienced by ARC of San Diego, FACT, Elder Help, City of Vista were caused by issues that I mentioned earlier. So those driver shortages, the staff shortages, inflation, gas price, things like that. Um, so some of those grantees uh, increase the number of alternative service. So kind of flipping the model instead of bringing folks to a destination, they were bringing that destination service over. So bringing meals to them, bringing personal protective equipment during COVID, those sorts of things. So kind of changing that model or conducting either staff or volunteer or driver recruitments to try and bring folks in to help supplement what's happening on the program. So the takeaway here is that operating and contracted services grants provided over 450,000 one-way passenger trips in this one-year period. And the number of trips is pretty consistent with the amount of funding that each of them spent. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that included in the FY25 draft budget is funding to conduct a regional specialized transportation needs assessment. So Brian mentioned this earlier, the assessment is gonna identify how many older adults and individuals with disabilities actually need the service and where do they live, where do they need to go? So the map that's on the left is from the 2020 coordinated plan and it shows, it's kind of hard to see, but there's some little teeny tiny green dots on here that shows where our older adults live in the region. Through the assessment, we could transform this into a map similar to the one that's on the right that can show where those travel patterns are, the connections, things like that. And this assessment could provide a data-driven foundation for our special specialized transportation planning and funding, and hopefully will inform the next coordinated plan, the 2025 coordinated plan. So we could also use the results of this study to enhance the coordination among the different providers that are in our region so that our funding and our resources can be maximized. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Mike at MTS, and he's gonna discuss his services. It's gonna follow by Chris um, at NCTD, and then we'll turn it back over to the chair for questions. All right, well, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Member Shu and members of the committee. Uh, again, I'm Mike Wigan, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at San Diego MTS, and we prepared a kind of an overview of the access service that we provide within our region, so. Uh, the territory is the same as our fixed route. It's over 3,000 uh, square miles within the San Diego region. Um, the access service uh, is required by law. I'll go through in a minute a couple of different um, federal regulations in the ADA. Um, but basically, we have a, a, a overlay of our paratransit system where a fixed route is. Anywhere within a three-quarter of a mile of a fixed route bus stop, a fixed route line, a transit center, not necessarily the rail line because that's not somewhere that you could uh, access our fixed route systems, um, but you have a three quarter mile on both sides of that is also within the region uh, necessary for our access program. Uh, we provide the transportation uh, to individuals who are not functionally capable of riding fixed route. It could be uh, a physical or a cognitive disability, uh, they go through a certification to get qualified for that. But it's it's uh, it's another overlapping service for those who can't use fixed route. Um, and it, and the trips can be used for a, a multitude of things. There's no limit to it. It can be the grocery store, uh, medical services. Uh, it, it can be for recreational needs. Um, not only is there no limitations, we can't ask, so we can't prioritize. Uh, those trips based on uh, their need. Um, ag again, the regulations, uh, the big one is the federal CFR 49 part 37. Uh, again, it requires what we call, and we use this phrase a lot, and I'll probably use it a few times in the slide, comparable, comparable paratransit for any recipient who gets fixed route. Um, it also under the ADA, there's requirements that specifically say that there's a safety net requirement for paratransit, realizing that all of our vehicles for, for, for fixed route for public transit are now ADA accessible. There needs to be one additional layer because they still may not be able to use uh, those vehicles, even though they're equipped with uh, all the devices necessary to be accessible. So what does comparable or comparable mean? That means that we operate it at the same hours of service, uh, the same days of the week, uh, the same regions, 
uh, and we provide the same level of service as a minimum. Uh, that's an important key because we are legally required to provide this service if you provide fixed route and it has to be comparable. Your performance numbers need to be the same. Uh, as you'll see later on, it's, it's fairly expensive service. Uh, so they wanna make sure the agencies aren't trying to cut corners to save costs. So uh, we also have a negotiated window. Um, if someone just layman's explanation, if someone needed a trip at 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, the law allows us to regulate or, excuse me, negotiate a window uh, saying, well, we have availability. We may have availability at nine. In a lot of cases we do, um, but we can negotiate as early as nine and as early as 10, whatever works best for the customer, but we cannot deny the trip. We have to work something out in that window. And as per the regulations, uh, on time is within 30 minutes of that agreed time frame. Um, the rides can be shared like they are on fixed route. Uh, sometimes they're not, but a lot of times they are. And you compare the travel times to fixed route as a maximum, meaning that if you were to work, use fixed route uh, to get to your location, uh, the walking time, the boarding time, a uh, transfer time, and that fixed route time would be considered as the maximum amount of time that that trip could be on, on an access vehicle or paratransit. In most cases, it's significantly lower but on no circumstances are you allowed to have a trip that's longer. Again, comparing it to fixed route. Um, reservation windows, the, the standard is a two, uh, a two day prior to your trip. Uh, we at MTS have a 10 day window. Um, and, the, and trips can also be booked on a, um, an appointment based or a drop off or pickup, meaning, well, I don't know how long the trip's gonna be, but I need to be at my doctor by nine o'clock. So that's the window that we'll work with. And then we back out of that to determine a pickup time, or they can just say, I wanna be picked up at eight o'clock and we work with that. Um, a little bit about the operating standards. The, the minimum requirement is curb to curb. We also provide door to door service. Unlike fixed route, we can actually carry their, their luggage or their groceries uh, to their door. We also have, uh, although not required by the law, but at MTS, we have a do not leave alone uh, provision, uh, meaning that we, we have certain clients, about 25% of our clients, uh, that we physically hand them off to a caregiver, a family member, and vice versa, both on pickups and drop-offs um, for whatever they need. Um, they can also have for free a, a personal care assistant. And so we see a lot of people with special needs uh, that would have a, what we call a PCA. Uh, they can also have companions ride. Uh, they would have to pay the full fare. And full fare for paratransit is $5 by law. It cannot be double, cannot be more than double your fixed route. Um, so we're limited to how much we can charge. Um, the average cost of a trip in our, in our system is, we, we're pretty proud of it, but it is, as you can see, very high compared to a fixed route of $58 per trip on average compared to just about five and a half dollars for a fixed route trip. Uh, eligibility, uh, you're not, you know, it's not based on requests. It's based on your functional ability to use fixed route. Uh, again, it can be a cognitive or a physical disability. Uh, we don't base eligibility on the, dis the diagnosis of the disability because people can have varying uh, functionality depending on their disability. Uh, there's four different kinds of certifications. There's unconditional, that means you can ride at any time we provide the service based on hours, days, uh, location. A conditional uh, can be geographically, like uh, there's too much of a rise or an increase uh, for me, if I, if I was certified, there are certain areas I can't uh, deal with ramp angles or elevation grades. Uh, it can be conditional based on vision impairments. Um, I can manage fixed route in the daytime when there's good vision and as my vision deteriorates in the evening, that would mean you would have access to paratransit in the evening based on conditional. Uh, temporary is usually for you know short-term disabilities, injuries, whether they be cognitive or physical. Um, and then there's a visitor program. So we accept everyone who is certified by other agencies, both in the state of California and outside the state of California uh, to provide them services when they're visiting the San Diego region. And then the last would be ineligible. Uh, this verification is a two-step process. There's a medical verification, and then there's an in-person assessment at our MTS facility at IED here. Uh, that is done by a, a, a contractor MTM within our building. Uh, we provide eligibilities once they're certified for up to five years. That's a little more than the industry standard. Uh, we do provide free rides to and from the certification center. 
Um, and there's an appeal process if they're not comfortable with the certification that was granted. Uh, the operations, the physical act of providing the trip is under contract to MTS through First Transit and their parent company, Transdev. Um, it's operated out of our Copley uh, Park Division here in the middle of San Diego. Uh, the facilities and all the vehicles are owned by MTS. We procure them, we supply them. Uh, we are the grant recipient and the oversight. So we're very active with them, both at the facility and through data and other uh, technology that gives us performance indicators. But they do provide a turnkey operation, uh, you know, the operators, the vehicle maintenance, the reservation scheduling, dispatching, uh, a true turnkey performance from them. Uh, they also do a, a small amount of trips through subcontractors. Uh, in, in good times, subcontractors are used for routes that are a little more inefficient, maybe at the edge of our service area, uh, where there'll be a one trip ride, and we don't want to use some of our bigger vehicles uh, dedicated to a, a longer trip like that. Uh, each operator is a commercial driver, uh, has a commercial driver's license on top of a few other certifications. The big one is VDDP uh, with the CHP in the state. Um, and about 65% of our trips are actually ambulatory customers and the remainders are, are done on mobility devices or wheelchairs. Uh, these are a couple of examples of the vehicles, uh, the dedicated fleet, uh, you see the cutaway on the top left and then the minivan on the, in the bottom right. Uh, there's about 175 in the fleet right now of dedicated vehicles that goes up and down uh, based on procurements and, and life expectancy of vehicles. Uh, we'll probably shoot up closer to 200 here pretty soon. Uh, the cab on the right, uh, top right, and the other vehicle on the left are examples of the subcontractor vehicles. Uh, some of them are what we call wave or uh, accessible vehicles, and some are sedans for the ambulatory customers. A little bit about the ridership. Uh, we were moving pretty steadily, consistently 40,000 people a month uh, pre-COVID. As with everything else, uh, COVID had a major effect on our ridership. Um, on average, throughout FY21, it dropped nearly 80%. I can tell you there were times we were down 90%. Uh, during COVID, and a lot of that is because of the group homes and the facilities that they were taking these trips to were closed. And that's there's still some of that today. Uh, ridership has continued to grow. We've had um, significant increases in ridership that we're trying to catch up with uh, as centers open up and things uh, kind of open up post-COVID. Uh, ridership is out. Actually, this is slightly dated. Uh, it's almost 60% of pre-COVID levels. And as we still see more and more homes open up or facilities open up, uh, that ridership will continue to grow to get us back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, here's just a graph, um, no surprise to anybody, that big huge drop in red was COVID. Uh, and then you see the lines below it each year, uh, orange, blue, green, as the progressive years as we've increased ridership, you'll see in the green a little bit of a dip uh, in the last part of last fiscal year, that was unfortunately a, a labor uh, issue that we had. And so um, we directed a lot of customers to other locations um, uh, while we provided supplementary service. Uh, a little bit about the operating budget. Uh, it's a little over $20 million uh, right now at the 55%. Um, as you can see from the graph on the right and, and the bullet points, the, really the heart of our operating is TDA. Um, we get it, you know, we get uh, 4.5 and 4.0 as was mentioned uh, previously. Um, and we are expecting another 20% in our growth, getting us to FY25. Uh, we also have some, some federal money. Uh, we get money from FAERS, Transnet, um, and a couple other little small areas. Um, the majority of our vehicle procurements are specialty grants or uh, specifically through 5310. Uh, as with everything else, the inflation, I know some people may look at the cost of the vehicle of 190,000, that is the paratransit vehicle with our propane, excuse me, our propane uh, vehicles for emissions purposes. Um, so that they, they do have an increased cost and as everything's gone up, but they last anywhere for five to seven years, depending on how they were certified. And um, I think that's it. Uh, I think we're going to save the questions for the end. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Um, I am uh, Chris Orlando. I am Chief Planning and Communications Officer uh, for North County Transit and am also serving as uh, Interim Chief Operations of BUS. 
um, which includes our uh, paratransit and specialized transit uh, services. I have with me Robert Giabo, who runs our paratransit and specialized transit uh, services. So um, I will go through of what uh, those services look like in NCTD service areas. Uh, I won't go through our, um, our federally mandated service the operating standards, I think Mike did a really good job of that. We operate under a very similar um, federal structure and requirements that MCS does. Uh, so what I will go through is just a high level look of what that means in North County. Um, so again, uh, it's uh, it, Americans with Disabilities ADA on demand service. Um, as Mike noted, uh, we provide that service within the same uh, span as our fixed route services. Um, that is a $5 uh, one-way fee regardless of trip length. Uh, and it does include if you have a caregiver or caregiver to come along with, with the ride. Um, this service is provided to those that are eligible. Um, it's it's um, uh, who cannot generally, you know, Mike went through the parameters, but generally it's, it's individuals who uh, cannot safely ride and board our fixed route service. Um, it is door-to-door -door service um, um, where needed. Uh, so really anywhere emanating from our, our uh, service area into anywhere in the county they wanna go. Um, and it does not allow for refusal of service. So we will take you know folks who are eligible and, and included in the program anywhere they need to go within the service area and really within the county. Um, just to give you a sense of what that looks like for us, this is a little hard to read, but the, um, the uh, reddish, orangish areas is uh, our county population. Darkest areas would be the most heavily populated. Uh, the light blue area is NCTD service area, about 1,000 square miles uh, in North County and then incorporated areas. Uh, and then the dark blue area is what our uh, coverage area uh, looks like. As Mike noted, um, we're federally mandated to do a, a three-quarter of a mile a budget around or a buffer around our fixed routes. Um, but as you can see, because of our fixed route coverage, that actually covers the majority of, of the populated areas within our, our service area. Um, our board took the step in April of 2023 um, to provide additional coverage beyond that requirement. Um, there were some really awkward gaps in the coverage. Uh, we called them donut holes, where because of the um, where the fixed route um, uh, routes ran, uh, there was just some holes in the middle of the, the dark blue area. So our board approved uh, providing service uh, in those gaps because it, it didn't you know, really make sense to us not to include those in it. So this is what the service area covered uh, looks like. Um, this is where those folks are going. So really all over the county, and as you can see, these are these are critical rides. Um, these are our top destinations for our lift service. Um, it includes medical, um, work, um, family use centers. Um, these, these destinations represent um, about 75% of overall riders uh, the program. So, the, so these are rides um, where folks need to go. Um, but we also provide rides, you know, wherever someone wants to go. So this is really not just about critical rides, but also about mobility for a very uh, a population that needs that service. Um, the medical facilities represent about 30,000 rides a year, um, work about 50,000 rides a year, or I'm sorry, 25,000 miles a year, rides a year. So, so um, it really is comprehensive. Uh, in terms of our Ridership, um, as Mike noted, um, you know, COVID did uh, affect the ridership. Many of the locations on the previous slide were closed during COVID, so those uh, the um, ADA ridership dipped considerably during COVID. But it has been um, coming back considerably. Um, last fiscal year, we had nearly 100,000 rides um, and a 30% year-over-year increase from the prior years, nearly. So, so um, it is an increasing um, uh, every year, and we expect that to continue. Um, here are some of our metrics. Um, we know these are our, our most vulnerable folks, so we work hard to, to continually improve these metrics. Um, you know, the dip in COVID changed the nature of this service. So, you know, like many of other services, it's in a rebuild mode. Uh, and so um, you can see here what, what our metrics look like in terms of performance. Uh, and then operating expenses. So you can see um, our operating expenses have increased. Um, the uh, expenses, the cost for this service for NCTD in FY 2023 um, was a little over $11 million. Uh, and then this is our FY uh, 24 budget for our lift operating budget. Um, a little bit different makeup than, than MTS noted. So we have a large portion that we make up through other sources. But as you can see, the, the core funding and the consistent funding is similar to, um, to what MTS has. Um, the TDA 4.5 represents about 21% of what um, the funding makeup is. Um, the lift operating budget for this fiscal year uh, is just over $13, uh, $13 million. And as Jenny noted in her presentation, our TDA 4.5 portion of that is about $2.8 million. 
And with that, I will uh, close and I think the group will take any questions. Let's move on uh, to public comment. So uh, Francesca, do we have any uh, public commenters on this item? Thank you, Chair, we do. Um, Earl DeShazer, if you'd like to step up to the podium, you'll be first followed by Timothy Bylash. Good morning. Thank you all for allowing me to talk. I really appreciate it. And I'm here for the Transportation Aid Society. I'm a participant. I've had cancer and a few other problems. The point is that if I hadn't had that transportation, even with family near, there's no way that I'd be in the hell that I am right now and able to stand up. I've gone from wheelchair to walking again. I'll tell you, it's been an adventure. Uh, I'd like to speak on their behalf because without them, I would not be here. The ability to travel, I had to give up my car and things of that nature to, to accommodate these new conditions. And they have been an absolute miracle to me. Always on time to see my oncologist and other doctors that I uh, uh, participate with. And I don't really quite know what to say to you, but I, I have to tell you that without them, I would not be standing here right now. Are there any questions or comments for me? Well, in that case, I want to thank you again for your time, and I want to thank you for what you do, because it's an incredible miracle in my life. And if you really want any other questions, believe me, I'm excited to share them. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I think our next speaker will be Timothy Bylash, who will be followed by the original draw. Thank you again, Transportation Board of Sandeg, uh, and your attention to these issues. Thank the presenters for their extensive report and remind us of the ways SANDAG coordinates and integrates <clears throat> all the forms of transportation to try to make it more efficient and climate friendly. Um, I um, want to emphasize the need to integrate point-to-point -point transportation uh, it, and not just segments that seem sexy or fetish at the moment. I want to make a plug for the undercarriage charging of vehicles to lighten weight and increase efficiency in these vehicles. There are new batteries being developed. I, I cannot tell you the explosion in the scientific literature about this and the engineering that's being proposed. I don't think we pay enough attention because lightening the weight of these uh, vehicles, uh, especially when they have specialty needs, uh, will improve the mileage as well, I want to note that um, Sweden and France has projects that already are using wireless undercarriage charging, inductive charging. Uh, and one project in Sarteli, excuse my pronunciation, Sweden, that I pulled this week, charges a bus in 10 minutes for 10 kilometers of travel. And so I think we keep ignoring the scientists and the scientific advances that we could put our efforts into and keep trying the same old tired decisions taste great and less filling back and forth. There's also an explosion in battery technology coming in the next 10 years. Now that's science is my background and I'm willing to talk with anybody. I will send some of these articles to the clerk if you're interested. Science is not easy. Thank you for your time. I think our next speaker will be the original draw, who will be followed by Brian DeVore, and Brian will be our final speaker on this item. Timothy, do you did you mean a pun in that? Because you said explosion of batteries. I don't know. <laughs> um, anywho, so growth, uh, you were talking about the growing number of seniors and people with disabilities. Again, I don't know why we're talking about people 
more people with disabilities. That's kind of sad to think about. Um, but I do appreciate the gentleman um, that spoke first and was telling his story because, um, you know, I was just uh, in a wheelchair for eight years. And um, I think this is important to provide to the people. But I'm wondering how you are um, engaging with them to uh, allow the like to give them the information so that they know that these services are available. If you actually have, um, you know, uh, stuff that you're doing regarding that, or if you just have people that come to you and re request the service. But I mean, do they have to go about, you know, just like searching online to find out where um, this would be available? And then as you're talking about NCTD, about the $5 one-way trip and you're, you will take them wherever they need to go, does that mean you go outside of your zone? Um, or is it, do you mean wherever within the zone um, that you have? And if it's not in the zone, would they have to, you know, access like an MTS um, transit to get to where they need to go? Or will you fulfill the obligation if they needed to go, say, to the airport or something? Um and then is with MTS, I'm wondering if that's a $5 fee for the entire trip, or is it also one way? Um, and then if people can't pay um, and they're having trouble financially, are there ways for them to access this without um, having to pay that $5? Um, and do you offer that, or is that something they have to figure out on their own? Um, because I know there's obviously going to be some people that can't afford that. Um, but the more you can let people know about this, I think it's important. So whatever kind of outreach you can do to these people would be um, benefit to them and their lives. I think our next speaker is Brian DeVore. You can go ahead when you're ready. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Brian DeVore. I'm uh, the vi one of the vice chairs uh, on the board for Elder Help. And uh, Elder Help was obviously mentioned earlier. Um, Elder Help's a nonprofit whose mission is to help seniors living independently in their own homes. Um, for 50 years, we've been assisting seniors and their families throughout San Diego County, reaching over 260,000 individuals. Our experience helps us to understand the unique challenges that seniors face, accessing basic assistance to meet daily needs. This wow. includes accessible, affordable, safe, and reliable transportation. Um, Elder Help's uh, Seniors a Go Go program. Uh, provide seniors, uh, many with chronic conditions who are at risk of falls with door-to-door, -door, curb to curb, and even door to door service for those seniors that can't navigate their appointments on their own. Operating an individualized transportation program ensures our clients can get rides to medical and non-medical appointments from volunteer drivers who are vetted and trained to work with the population and the needs that may arise during a ride. Seniors can safely and easily get where they need to go because volunteer drivers pick them up and transport them to a destination without fixed routes or schedules. Senior to Go-Go is vital to the San Diego County uh, senior community. It's an option that provides more personalized customization to meet the changing needs of those we serve. Um, we're appreciative of the support we receive from SANDAG to do this important work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We do have one additional public speaker on this item. Uh, I'm sorry, hands are continuing to go up. If um, everybody who would like to speak on this item could raise their hand now rather than waiting until I call on you, that would be helpful for time management purposes. Um, we do have two more speakers, uh, Spirit and then Christina or Christiana Ortiz, who will be our final speaker. I'm not sure who you're calling on. I'm Spirit. Yes, I called on you. You can go ahead with your comments. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Spirit. I'm a client of Elder Help, and I'm so glad I find them. I do not have all the disabilities that are necessary to qualify for a lot of the, the rides that are, I spent hours on the internet trying to find rides to get to the doctors and I have many of them. I'm 82, I have a lot of health challenges. I live a long distance from my bus stop. I've tried that to get there with my walker and it's really hard to breathe with COPD. When I found elder, and I've tried the Jewish Community Center, but it seems that my zip code was not in their service. And so finally I found elder help and they were so welcoming 
and loving. And I know that we need help to keep this service going. And it's not just for doctors. Um, Elder help will take you to the doctor, take you to the grocery store. And Brian, thank you for filling in all the details. So as a client, I, I know that we need the help to keep this going because it's so personal. And it's so lovely to just have someone come by and pick me up at the door on time and take me to a doctor or a serious dentist appointment. And I don't know what I would do without them because the other choices demand so much more for qualifications. And that puts me right back on the bus, walking up to the bus stop with my walker, taking my walker on the bus and my hats off to MTS for how you take care of people on your scooters. When they load you on the bus, I think it's amazing. And I am just so happy and I hope that we stay on your list for donations because we are totally funded by donations and everybody volunteers. So we need your help. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Our final speaker on this item will be Christiana Ortiz. You can go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you all for your time. I am actually calling to speak about the Jewish Family Services on the Go program. Is this the appropriate time to talk about that? Yes, you can. Great, thank you. So um, Jewish Family Service has significantly improved the life of my grandfather. I am his only caregiver and only relative and um, he also, like the previous speaker, did not qualify for a lot of the programs because he's still mobile. However, the only reason his, his doctor says the only reason he is mobile is because of the physical therapy that he's getting. Since I have to work, I can't take him to all of the appointments. Because of Jewish Family Services on the go program, I've actually been able to keep working and keep him healthy. Um, I think it's really important to care for our seniors who've given so much to our community. For instance, my grandfather volunteered for the San Diego Police Department for 23 years, providing a valuable service that freed up a lot of police manpower. I know the other seniors who use Jewish Family Services on the Go program have also given to their communities and a lot of them don't have someone to speak on their behalf. As mentioned earlier, the population of older adults in San Diego is significantly growing and on the go has taken significant steps to improve the availability of their services. I strongly urge you to consider the good Jewish Family Service and their on the go program is doing in our community and uh, continue to fund their program so that they can continue to serve seniors and their families. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That concludes the public speakers. Thank you, Francesca. So for any committee members, uh, do we have any questions or uh, questions we want to make uh, to uh, Brian, Jenny, Mike, Chris, and Robert? Or Vice Chair Grams. I actually have quite a few. Um, I, I would ask first that the uh, transit agencies um, speak to the public comment about uh, single seat versus two seat rides for these uh, customers. Um, what happens when a rider lives in one service area and uh, transfers over to another service area? Thank you, Ms. Krantz, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we work collaboratively within our zones. Um, when we pick up customers and we, we cross over into the threshold, which would be in our case, if we were to pick someone up at, in, in our service region and then transfer them to North County Transit. We have a defined, uh, basically a five mile radius. Um, you know, geographically, you could see on our maps where we're supposed to stop, but just for efficiency purposes and to help the customers, we'll go a few extra miles within that. That's why we draw a five mile loop on both inland and the coastal corridors of where we would then uh, transfer. So we, we try to give them a little buffer if they're just like the VA, for instance. Uh, the VA is theoretically our geographical limit, um, but we'll go and so will North County. We'll cross in for a couple of extra miles, but at some point too, we do actually have to draw the line. So that's organized. We schedule a time to pick up and meet each other 
Uh, we usually try to always get there ahead of the other uh, provider and then hand off and then get them to their destination. We both use uh, the same scheduling systems and uh, trapeze. And so we have a lot of uh, uh, continuities to ensure that the customers get as efficiently as possible. So what, what determines that you have to draw the line? What is there a legal reason that you have to transfer a rider? Um, I would assume that, um, say for example, a wheelchair bound rider um, that had to be transferred would be quite an operation on the side of the road. Yeah, well, it, it, we wouldn't do it on the side of the road. We have defined areas if we do mm -hmm. actually do the transfer. Good to hear that. Yeah, they're usually within transit centers for the most part. Um, but yeah, within uh, 49 CFR, you know, we're defined to provide, that's the limit for efficiency purposes. If we were to provide mm -hmm. longer trips, obviously it'd have an increased cost, but it would really limit our ability to provide the the comparable, comparable service within our region. So unfortunately, a, a limit has to be established. Typically, agencies will just, that's the line. But we have so many customers, especially around the VA, uh, all the facilities there, workplaces, whatnot, that, and it was, oh, I don't know, it was probably seven, eight years ago, we worked out an agreement to basically draw a circle so that we can limit some of those transfers so that they then just went another two miles on the other uh, yeah. Provide. Yeah, Chris, on one of your slides, you had uh, some pins for where you serve, and one of them was pretty far south. So does that is was that an indication that that particular uh, service that you provided to that location was a two-seat ride? Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, I'm going to walk through the staff report here just a little bit to uh, clarify a couple things. One is that uh, there was an indication the um, in the um, TDA funding for community transit, a uh, fact is uh, a grantee and they are operating a call center. And that uh, made me wonder how many of the service providers operate their own call center versus a single call center. In other words, how many, how many when somebody needs a ride um, and they maybe hear about Jewish family services, that, that becomes their go-to provider versus fact versus MTS versus NCTD. Or is it two one one and 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 we'll help you through this and it's a one call. So it's it's two things. So you know, for example, Jewish Family Service has their own service, so folks can call directly to the individual providers. They can also call FACT as the CTSA, who will do referrals and mention you know based on where you're located or where you're trying to go. You know, maybe Jewish Family Service is the best provider for you, or paratransit, or whatever that might be. So callers can come multiple directions, and then they'll get referred based on what their need is and who can best serve what they're looking for. <laughs> And I assume fax uh, call center work is uh, um, intended is for scheduling rides mostly. I think it's a, a mixture of True scheduling stuff. and also referrals. Okay, and then um, there's a there's a spreadsheet that you put together, very interesting, um, and it has a column that says estimated annual number of people served, and then it has a column right next to it that says active grant amount as of. September 2023, and it was interesting to see the number of people served versus the amount of the grant. And um, I also then had to go over and look at the grant type, which summer vehicles only, summer vehicles and operating. Um, you know, every every one of them has a, a little bit different, and it would be good to know what the breakdown of that that end number is, how much of it's vehicles and how much of it is uh, operations, um, uh, you know, just uh, not to pick on anybody, but JFS has 817 people that they serve, but $2.4 million is their active grant, as opposed to, let's say, FACT, which has 3,707 and 1.8 million. So, you know, those are the sort of discrepancies that would be good to have a little bit more information about MTS, 249, basically 250,000 people served for 1.7 million. So those variances are, uh, you know, it, it does raise questions and it would be good to know the details on that. Slide seven. Um, that was a, it took me a minute to kind of get that figured out. I was wondering why we were funding so much less in cycle two than we did in cycle 
one, and then I finally figured out that the that the spreadsheet, the graph was set up in a way that kind of was a little bit deceptive. There's, there's, it's not that far off. So it was, uh, shook me up there for a minute. Um, slide 14. Um, what this slide caused me to wonder is we allocate funding based upon the normal percentage of, you know, it's typical transnet funding, I think 71, 29. And if we know who are, if we know the number of, this list of individuals with disabilities served, whether the percentage breakdown between MTS and NCTD is the same. And uh, I think that use, that information would be very useful so that the allocation of the funding was more accurate when it comes to the number of people that each each agency is serving. Um, slide 17. Um, this was a slide that was a bit confusing uh, because of the fact that Jewish Family Service does their work so much more efficiently than others. But then I found out that they have a whole lot of volunteers that kind of makes a big difference. Um, so either having separate categories for providers that use volunteers or figure out some way to indicate the number of trips that were served by volunteers versus paid, I'm not sure a good way to do this. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Uh, this is just uh, for informational purposes. And I think that we have an obligation to the taxpayer to identify um, the efficiencies and the efforts that go into this. And um, we're blessed to have a number of organizations that are in this uh, space. And um, like the speaker talked about, I have experienced senior parents that um, we had to take car keys away from. So these are the sort of services that are really critical for those families. Um, slide 19. Um, again, this kind of speaks to um, the allocation of funding. Is that percentage that we use kind of a shorthand between MTS and, and NCTD? Does it really work? Um, that would be good to know. And to uh, the shocking number, average cost per ride, $112 for NCTD. It's, it's a remarkable amount of money. Um, 58 MTS, uh, it'd be interesting to kind of dig into that a little bit. You both use subcontractors. Is there anything that keeps you from using FACT and some of these other providers that uh, are, are big grantees? So you want, can I? Yes, please. So on the on the first question, just, just for clarification on our cost per trip. So we, we look at cost per trip uh, on a fully loaded basis. So it would include... Um, all of the um, overhead applications. So, for instance, a portion of my salary, a portion of Robert's salary, not just uh, not just gas and vehicles. So it's a it's a fully loaded look, and that allows us to compare it across modes well. Um, so, so that's why you might see it's a little bit of an apples to apples comparison. That's part of that. Uh, and then the second part of the question uh, answer is yes. In fact, we um, we use fact in in a number of um, uh, contexts. So we actually just launched. Uh, a same-day ride service with FACT through a, through a memorandum of understanding. Uh, and so we just launched that program last month. Right. Uh, and we are in active discussions with them to be a service provider to take on trips that we're not able to do for for staffing resources or other areas. So, so the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. And we hope to do more of it. Just a heads up, that may come up in the next agenda item too. <laughs> So uh, on, on the MTS side, that also is a loaded cost, but the big difference is really density. You know, the, the, he has a, a very large region uh, yep. to serve and picking up one customer way out in the middle of Valley Center can create some significant increases in its cost. I have a much more dense uh, population to serve. So it just, they're not, in my opinion, they're not doing a poor job. It's just yep. more difficult. And uh, we have used fact at times over the years. Um, they helped us a lot through the strike. We're not currently using them, but uh, we do have their number and we have at times used them through our contract with First Transit. Okay, thank you. And uh... if I could just add as well, um, this is Sharon with MTS. Um, the, the costs that are associated with an, a public agency like ours is also significant because we hire, um, we have union drivers 
with good wages. And they are required as well to have certifications that perhaps the providers in some of these other um, providers do not have. Um, and we are required to carry every passenger that it's qualified. So we cannot deny a trip because of its length. We cannot deny a trip because we don't have an available um, person to drive. So those all ratchet up the costs associated with the stuff that we as public agencies have to provide based on federal. Thank you for that information. And that leads me to another question. Do the NGOs have to, do they qualify their riders in the same way that the uh, transit agencies do? Somewhat. I mean, they don't have the same stipulations under ADA, like to certify, but they do ask, obviously, what folks right. need to try and make sure that they're providing trips to folks that need it versus referring them to another service that might also work for them. But ultimately, uh, some of those decisions are up to the NGO to decide, um, you know, if it's in an area that's, you know, they got volunteers or whatever. We, we don't, we, SANDAG doesn't stipulate any requirements for them. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, the grants, the 5310 and the senior mini grants do have, I believe it's an 80% requirement to, if you're applying for a senior mini grant, at least 80% of your riders should be seniors. And we understand that sometimes they have a companion or friends or if the grantees can use the vehicle for someone else. So they do sometimes throw someone else on the vehicle, but they are, they are expected to meet, I believe it's the 80%. Okay. Um, and then so for 5310, it's both seniors and individuals with disabilities if they're using those grants. Okay, thank you. And the presentation uh, made reference to one-way trips a lot. Is was is that kind of an uh, an accounting thing, or tell me how frequently we send a driver out to drop somebody off, and then send an, and they, that driver comes back, and then another driver goes out and picks them up and brings them back versus wait. No, we use the metric because it may be they're going multiple destinations on okay. a loop. So it just helps to provide some sort of basis, but it doesn't mean left, dropped off, coming back. And we're being efficient about all of that. The agencies, everybody's working to be as efficient as possible. Absolutely. Um, finally, uh, I see a couple of cities on the slide. Um, I only saw the city of Vista in the spreadsheet. I don't know whether that means Del Mar is no longer a part of it. Um, what is it that qualifies a city to be uh, a part of this program? The cities, as long as they are providing the service and they meet the funding agency requirements can. City of La Mesa had a program for a number of years and stopped providing it. I think it's really them and cost and determining how they can do those or are they letting the NGOs do that. Um, it kind of varies. Oceanside is another one that had a service and sometimes they drop off and then they come back in a couple of years. I think it's really just them and trying to understand fiscally what works for them. But yeah, there's only a few mentioned, but there's some back history with some that have been here. And I promise this is my last question. Um, I see a resident of Encinitas, Dan Tota is here and I appreciate him coming. He has been very dependent upon this service. And if Chris could kind of explain, I know at one point there were some fair issues that impacted him where he had to pay twice uh, to go to a particular location. Does, does that ring a bell at all to you? And, and what drove that? It, it does not, Robert, you might, do you know? Yeah, I'm happy to look into it, but don't, not familiar with the individual case. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your indulgence, thanks. Sorry for so many questions. Mayor Sanchez. Thank you, I just wanted to clarify the um, picture about Oceanside, the city of Oceanside had had, uh, had had qualified for the mini grant and we were definitely uh, for senior transportation um, for several years and then we ended up not getting it last time. And so we've been struggling with that. That was something that we uh, could not understand why we didn't qualify because obviously we have a lot of seniors in Oceanside. We, we're the largest, we're the third largest city in the county. So um, that has been a struggle for us, but definitely, um, uh, fact is actually located in Oceanside, and uh, we're very happy that they're there um, while operating for the whole county. But if we had more money, we would definitely put it in senior transportation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. R real quick, um, following on Vice Chair Kranz's comments a little bit, the uh, you know, it's difficult to look at the cost per trip numbers without understanding what's going into that. So in the future, as we 
bring data like this back, it would be useful to have a little bit more detail there. And in particular, maybe a couple additional metrics, for example, average time per trip or average distance per trip, if those things are tracked, that might be a useful thing to see as well to help shed a little bit of light on this. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Azito. Any other comments? Councilman Duncan. Thank you, I appreciate all the information and I know everybody's been uh, fully candid. It is, and I appreciate your all the questions that have been asked because it is hard to get a grasp on some of it because it is apples to oranges. To me, it's definitely not apples to apples or oranges to oranges. And even when a statement is said, there's usually a qualifier. If, you know, for instance, MTS says, oh, we're not by law allowed to not provide a ride. Well, yeah, unless it's not in your ge geography, right? You don't do rides. So you just said there's these buffers and all these zones and there was donut holes and there's hands off, hands off. So all the statements I'm listening and then I subsequently hear, oh yeah, there's there's qualifiers on, on those statements. So, you know, we were talking about, obviously, I don't think all the nonprofits would exist in this area if, you know, the whole county was seamlessly covered by MTS and NC TD. So um, I guess my question is, and maybe it's part of the next agenda item, I know they're bleeding together, but which is fine, but what agencies, for instance, am I right or am I wrong? If someone is in a wheelchair and they need a ride that crosses your jurisdictions, why would they use MTS or NCTD if they can call a nonprofit that will give them one ride instead of having to switch vehicles? That's not as efficient and as seamless as possible. Doesn't that take much longer? Is that, I mean, am I accurate with that? What I'm saying, anyone? Uh, hey, good question. I'd, I'd take a shot at that. Um, you, first off, historically at $5, we would be cheaper. Sure. Um, just because you're in a wheelchair um, by law, you're not necessarily certified for paratransit. Again, you have to go through that certification. It's whether or not you're functionally capable of using fixed route because uh, on public transit, all fixed route, whether it be sprinter, coaster, trolley, bus, they're, they're all accessible uh, with wheelchair ramps and securement. So we're required to and very regularly carry people in mobility devices. So uh, to some extent, some of the customers may not meet the qualifications uh, to use paratransit. So thus, uh, the additional NGOs would potentially be an option. Thank you. Hopefully and that helps. Thank you. Uh, and for instance, one of the other qualifiers that sort of stood out to me for a moment was when like NCD was saying, we also contract with private or with the nonprofits, I should say probably a better term for areas where we can't serve for whether it's staffing issues or, you know, capacity issues. The reason those stand out to me is because we, I'm sure everybody here all cares about this issue and wants to know, you know, what are the gaps that have to be feel, filled? You know, why do these nonprofits exist? And obviously that goes significantly into our decisions on how we fund them. Yeah, so I think I think you're actually touching on the, the right questions here, which is, and the right answer really, which is um, we need a variety of providers for a variety of types of services. So um, the public agencies operate under very prescriptive federal mandated rules. And so, you know, that um, in some ways constrains what we can do. It, it, it enables us and requires us to do certain things, but also constrains what, what we can do. So so the long list that Jenny showed of other providers fill very important gaps uh, in terms of what we're allowed to do and what we're main, uh, mandated to do. So I think what, what you're what you're talking about, I think, is, is the right discussion around how does the um, universe of services meet the need rather than this service or that service. So where we would use um, purchase transportation would be because we are required to provide that ride, um, we wanna make sure that we can um, flex up or down depending on the need. And so we, we do that purchase transportation piece when um, our current staffing or current vehicle allotments don't, don't allow us to meet the capacity, but maintaining the full capacity for the max load wouldn't be efficient for us. And so using using the contracted services help, help with that efficiency. That, does that make sense? Yeah, yes, thank you. And I just had one quick question um, for Ms. Russo. The, I think it was slide 16, if I am remembering properly, that showed all of the ridership volume um, from the different entities. Is it 16? I think it's 19, yeah. Is, where do all these numbers come from? Are they, are they 
Are these all self-reported numbers from the agencies to SANDAG? Yes, so they report quarterly, and this is all of the data that we've accumulated over that one year period. Okay, and so this is a mix, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding it properly. This is a mix of any specialized transportation ride they give or any ride they provide? No, so these are just the rides that they've provided using our funding. They could have other rides outside of this that isn't represented here. Okay, and that is another in interesting real question right, that we're talking about is, you know, would you say using SANDAG funding, but it's also a mix of other funding they may have as right. well. So it, it is hard to, you know, if a small service has 10 vehicles donated to them or paid for by something else, obviously, you know, their ride <clears throat> cost per ride is going to be significantly different and, and kind of hard to compare. But I, I do appreciate all the information. So thank you very much. Any other questions for this panel? Um, I have one kind of a broad question before we get into the next item. So, uh, Brian, Jenny, maybe you can shed some light. Uh, this isn't the first time Sandag has had to dealt with these funds and distribution of funds and calculate. So, so leading up to the next item, can you give us a little historic um, background and maybe Colleen can because she's she and, and and Grace has been here for a while, uh, in terms of how we got to where we are. Uh, uh, I remember years ago when I was in the audience, a um, uh, lot of discussion of being objective and using a grant process. So give us a little historic background of uh, of how we derived to the system we've been, been using. Are you looking for how we got to today, like the situation we're in? <laughs> or more broadly, like what the grant program has done and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I remember um, Sandag boards uh, dealing with the criteria first and just the criteria so they wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, having to make decisions on who, which uh, recipients should receive so much of a grant funding because board members shouldn't be in the business of, of, of reading grant applications and all that. Uh, so we dealt with uh, criteria um, and then it was felt that um, let's get the politicians out of here and, and get the um, people who know something about um, this. So maybe you could say a word or two about who uh, who you we rely on, uh, Sandag relies on uh, for a uh, expert view because it is so complex and, and uh, to try to compare apples and oranges and, and watermelons. <laughs> Sure, so uh, board policy stipulates that the uh, Transportation Committee pro provides input on that evaluation criteria in the call for projects. So that does come here for all of you to consider as we're getting ready to put that call out. Ultimately, it goes to the board of directors who adopts the criteria in the call for projects and then it goes and gets released for reviewing the actual application. So when the applications come in, we rely on a system of all volunteers to review our applications and score them. So these are not Sandeg staff necessarily. These are usually folks from outside that have experience in this area in all shapes of, of life. They could be writers, they could be you know, a past provider who's retired, all sorts of things. As long as they're not directly connected to any of an applicant or have a conflict of interest, they're the ones that are reviewing this against the criteria, the goals of the program to decide who receives funding and going through that process. Um, you know, what got us here today, we are making some changes to that process. So we used to use a ranking system to kind of help screen out some of the evaluator bias that might have been happening in the program. We've removed all of that. So the next cycles of funding as you start seeing them, this program and all of ours is now going to use average scores, which will help mitigate some of that as well. So so what you'll be seeing is some normalized scoring across of those evaluators, a consensus score, if you will, that might help with some of these questions about why was one applicant, you know, recommended for funding versus another, and it can provide more of that feedback back to an applicant if they're not successful, so to help them understand what they need to do to compete in the future. All right. Any more questions? I really want to thank Brian, Jenny, uh, Mike, and Chris, and Ralph for, for being here on this panel. I know the data collection took many months, and, and that's all 
you know, Jenny, I know you've been working on this for quite some time, so we really appreciate that this report. It gives us a better idea of what what the universe of need and in providers are. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, I don't have any other questions. Uh, we'll go on to the next item, which is item number seven. And we're actually back with uh, Jenny and Brian. We'll present an overview of uh, funding options for facilitating access to coordinated transportation uh, and which from, from fact and specialized transportation services. So let's go ahead and share that. Uh, before we go into discussion further though, I'm gonna ask um, Francesca to uh, give a statement uh, concerning the conflict of interest. Thank you, Chair. Uh, item seven involves potential action on grant and funding awards. And prior to the committee's consideration of this item, I'd like to note for the record that potential recipients in potential recipients include MTS and NCTD who are represented on this committee. Additionally, FACT as a nonprofit is an additional potential recipient and Council Member Duncan and Deputy Mayor Edson are both members of the Transportation Committee and non-salaried members of the FACT Board of Directors. Based on these facts, the members are eligible to consider and vote on any action related to this item. Great, thank you. Jenny and Brian, please go ahead. All right, so almost exactly a year ago today, tomorrow will be the one year, this committee was provided with the funding recommendations for the Specialized Transportation Grant Program, the STGP, as I'll talk about it, the Cycle 12 Call for Projects. So for those of you who were on this committee at that time, you might recall that those funding recommendations did not include funding for FACT. Uh, for Ride Fact, which is a specialized transportation service that Fact offers, so they're actual trip providers. So when those funding recommendations were approved by the board, the staff was recommended to identify additional funding opportunities for Ride Fact. So we provided a summary of the sources that were available for services like Fact at your October meeting, and were then directed to work with Fact and the transit operators to fund a proposal that could fund to find a proposal that could fund FACT and bring to you for consideration. So we developed several options that could be considered and discuss those with FACT and the transit operators. But unfortunately, we weren't able to identify a solution that all the entities would be supportive of. So ultimately, the bottom line is there's just not enough funding for this very, very needed service for, and to provide it for every agency that's in this space and to give what folks need. So any proposed solution to fund FACT is going to result in less funding for either a transit agency or another one of our nonprofit providers. So it makes it really, really challenging. So the options that we have come up with for you are included in attachment one or these are pages 90 to 91 of the agenda package. So as you consider the options, I wanted to first provide an overview of FACS CTSA designation and the funding that it receives for those services. So SANAG designated FACT as the region CTSA in 2006 through a competitive process, and that designation does not have a termination date. The role of the CTSA is to promote the consolidation and coordination of social service transportation so that these services can be delivered in a cost-effective manner. The current scope of the CTSA service was defined based on the state legislative requirements, which does not include a transportation operating service like Ride Fact. So this is the reason that Fact is competing for funding and they don't get a direct allocation. So as shown on this slide, and this was also mentioned in the prior item on slide six, the FACT receives about 2% of the TDA Article 4.5 funding to provide their CTSA service for the region. The amounts that they've received each year are shown on this slide for some reference. And FACT uses this TDA funding to operate their call center for referrals, to hold quarterly meetings with other providers and stakeholders, and to provide a database of regional providers with an accompanying website. To complement their TDA funding, FACT has been awarded STGP mobility management grants, which fund short range planning and management activities that help improve coordination among service providers. So similar to what CTSA service is. The grants do not fund operating services like FRIED FACT. That's not what they're meant to do. 
So shown on this slide are the amounts of funding that FACT has received from both uh, STGP sub-programs over the last three cycles. And in the most recent cycle, FACT received a direct allocation of about 791,000 in FTA Section 5310 funding and was competitively awarded the same amount in senior mini grant funding. So in addition to serving as the region CTSA and performing mobility management activities, FACT also transports older adults and individuals with disabilities countywide through its operating service ride fact. It began receiving funding from the STGP in 2014 and has received funding from the program in subsequent years as a result of the competitive process. I now want to show you the data for how that funding has been used for ride fact. So apologies, there's some more grants and figures. I'm gonna try and walk you through these. So uh, in cycles 10 and 11, FACT requested and was awarded full funding for Ride Fact, receiving $800,000 in funding for each cycle. They also received an additional 352,000 in section 5310 COVID-19 relief funding for Ride Fact, which was about half of the total funding that was available. So this graph is showing you the monthly ride fact expenditures through our grant program from cycle 10 to cycle 11, which was about $2 million in funding. And the peaks and the valleys that are on this slide just show how variably the monthly expenditures were, especially during COVID-19. On this slide, it shows you the same three prior cycles of funding and the number of one-way passenger trips that were provided through ride fact. During this time, they provided about 77,000 total one-way passenger trips, which varied about month per month. The peaks and valleys here correlate to those on the prior slide, meaning that generally when their expenditures were high, it was because they were providing more trips. In each cycle of progress, Projects, applicants with operating services like RideFact state the number of one-way passenger trips that they will provide with the level of funding that they request. So the amount of funding is derived by the, the amount of funding per trip, sorry, is derived by dividing the total amount of funding by the number of proposed trips. So FACT's proposed rate was about $17 for one-way passenger trip in cycle 10, and it increased to about $18 in cycle 11, which is what the green dotted line is showing here on this slide. The blue line shows our actual expenditures per one-way passenger trip, which averaged about $25. It should be noted that many grantees, not just FACT, experience COVID-19 challenges, as we mentioned in the prior item. So those driver shortages, inflation, gas prices, um, and supply chain that helped, you know, really push that service delivery and those costs up. So now I want to share the timelines for our funding and what it might look like for FACT. And these are hypotheticals, but just trying to give you a, a picture of what things might look like. So this timeline shows the historical project timelines for FACT's mobility management service, so that CTSA service that was shown. So the purple line, and then there's a projected line, that dotted line of funding that could be used for FACT by those services that hasn't come in yet. So the first line is the TDA funding that's already been allocated to FACT through December of 2024, that solid line, followed by the projected time, the dotted line, that it will also be allocated for 2025 and 2026. The second line is for their Cycle 11 Mobility Management Grants, which began in early 2022 and are anticipated to be completed next month. And then last February, FACT was awarded a Cycle 12 Mobility Management Grant, and that funding will begin as soon as that Cycle 11 grant is spent. The third line shows the anticipated timeline for that funding, which has a contract duration of two years. And the last two lines show the timelines of when the upcoming cycle 13 funding would become available. And the takeaway on that slide is that fax mobility management services are funded through the STGP and expected to be active about through the summer of 2026. So for FAX operating service, so Ride Fact and Ride Fact Now, which is their AFA, the timelines are different, but demonstrate that funding is available through early 2025. The first two lines are their awarded grants, the Cycle 11 STGP and AFA Cycle 1. When Ride Fact service ended in mid-2023, those traps were converted to the AFA program, and Ride Fact Now services are anticipated to continue through May. 
The third line represents cycle 12 funding that they were awarded due to another grantee's forfeiture and unspent COVID-19 relief funding. So with this, FACT could resume ride FACT service in May and st staff anticipates this funding would be extended about 10 months or to March of 2025. The remaining three lines show the timelines for the AFA Cycle 2 and STGP Cycle 13 funding, which FAC could compete for and be awarded. While it's difficult to predict exactly when AFA and Cycle 12 funding would be exhausted, if FACT were successful in competing for funding through the Cycle 13 call, they could have funding for Ride FAC through 2026. All right. I know we're getting short on time. Um, we have a few options we're gonna go over and then um, I think I heard that we're gonna go to one minute for public comment. I let our friends back here know so they can prepare one minute comments instead of their plan two. But hopefully you all got that message. Um, as shown in attachment to the report, FACT requested approximately $844,000 a year to meet its ride fact demand. Sandag's data team uh, reviewed that memo and determined the ride fact request and methodology used were reasonable based on analysis of the baseline data fact provided and as well as the, with changes in fuel prices and population growth. FACT's total ask of $2.3 million includes both mobility management and then the ride fact costs. Any allocation of 5310 funds requires the 20% match of non-federal funds. And so, you know, that's why we're asking the Transportation Committee to consider allocating um, an increased TDA Article 4.5 funding to FACT to supply that required match, or it's, we're not asking, but it's in one of the options. Um, the Finance Department has really looked into all the other sources of funding that we have here at Sandag and have basically told us that the TDA 4.5 Senior Meeting Grant 5310 are the um, only sources of funds that can be used for um, operating ride fact services. Um, and so we've come up with the four options um, that TC can choose from. So option one fully funds their um, request. The CT alloc CTSA allocation of TDA funds for fact would increase from two to 6.5%. It's rounded up to seven on the chart, um, which is about $634,000 a year, up from 195,000 that they would have received in the, um, the current year. Um, I know these are the, the section 5310 funding graph on the right is a two year thing. So I'm splitting these numbers in half when I'm talking to you about them um, to kind of compare them with the annual fund on um, the TDA funds that we talk about as well as FACS annual request. Um, with that TDA change, MTS's share would go down by about $312,000 while NCTDs would decrease by about $127,000. The 53 allocation to fact would be about $1.7 million a year for a two-year total of the $3.5 million you see there. That would leave roughly $1.5 million a year for the other grantees to still compete for. If this option were chosen, staff would request that the Transportation Committee not allow FACT to further compete for 5310 and Senior Mini Grant um, funding through the STGB Cycle 13 call for projects that Zach's going to be bringing back later um, as they would be fully funded to meet their projected demand. For options one and then the next option as well, um, the TDA allocation changes would require an update to board policy 27 and we could do that and um, with your re uh, recommendation, we could do that in the coming months um, and in time for the cycle 13 changes that would Zach would be bringing this um, spring and summer. Option two, this partially funds the fact request, so it's kind of meeting a little bit uh, partially on the way there. It's increasing that uh, TDA allocation up to 5%, which is would be $488,000 a year up from their $195,000. MTS's share on that then would then go down by about $208,000, and NCTD uh, would decrease by $85,000. The 5310 allocation to fact would be about $1.2 million a year, Leaving, leaving roughly $2.1 million a year for the other grantees to compete for. If this option were chosen, um, we, staff would request that the Transportation Committee provide direction on how much we would allow FACT to further compete for um, some of the other uh, grants, knowing that they're not fully funded per their demand and requests. Option three um, asked that we would not touch the TDA allocation, but would allocate roughly $840,000 a year from the $5310 pot for an annual dedicated total of $1 million. 
um, including their current TDA allocation. The risk here is that fact would be short on that guaranteed match for the 5310 funds that I described before talking about the options. And then lastly, option four is leave it as is. Um, this would allow FACT to utilize its remaining AFA cycle one funding that Jenny was just discussing in those last two charts she was showing. Um, the section 35010 funding has, uh, it has been allocated through the cycle 12 call for projects and then to compete for funding in the AFA cycle two and cycle 13 call for projects that Zach will be bringing. This would allow staff to complete the specialized transportation needs assessment that we've been talking about as well as the FY 2025 coordinated plan. And then we would inform future specialized transportation policy and funding recommendations through that. So that's the four options um, at this point. We'll turn it back to you to discuss and provide direction. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Jenny. Uh, we're gonna go on to public comment, but let me explain uh, why I went from two minutes to one minute. Um, we're coming up on to uh, close to 12, which is close to our um, close time. And I'm worried about uh, us uh, keeping uh, enough board mem uh, committee membership so, so we can take a vote on this and have a quorum. Um, so that's why we went to one minute. Um, and so let's go ahead and start with club comment. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're gonna start with the folks in the room and then we'll go on to Zoom. If you are on Zoom and you would like to speak on this item, please do raise your hand now um, so that I know to call on you when we're finished with the folks in the room. Uh, Phil Monroe, if you'd like to step up to the podium, we'll call on you first and then Phil will be followed by Deborah Martin. Thank you very much. Phil Monroe Coronado. I oppose off the top funding for FACT. FACT's letter indicates Sandag defunded FACT. They did not. When FACT competed, they didn't get awarded because they didn't score high enough. I have to take about four points out, but I want to say one thing. I don't know where Jenny got her data about cost per ride, but FACT's data for last October, November, or July, August, September, October, show their cost per ride was an average of $97. And in one month, their cost was $118 per ride. That is a lot of money for a ride. The last thing I just share with you so you all know that they must have money. The board awarded their executive director last July at his performance review a 8% increase in salary to $245,000. That's a lot of money. Traveler's aid. Thank you, your time has expired. Traveler's aid total for four employees. Thank you. We do need to move on to the next speaker. Uh, Deborah Martin will be next, followed by Jean Durgan. Good morning. I'm Deborah Martin with Elder Help. I'm not going to tell you about Elder Help. It's in the packet. Um, I'm a member, a CEO, and also a member of the Coalition of San Diego Specialized Transportation Service Providers. The coalition is comprised of affected community members and five well-established and highly regarded county-based nonprofits, each with their own specialized transportation programs, which have been funded or are currently funded through 5310 and senior mini grants. Together, we've collectively provided more than 385,000 rides throughout the county, serving approximately 3,000 clients in 2023. Each of these programs provide critical, necessary services to different segments and populations within the county. We believe they deserve equal representation and consideration in today's discussion regarding carve-outs and a non-competitive bidding process favoring one organization over all others. We've come today to illustrate what true collaboration and coordination looks like. We're concerned about being potentially defunded or underfunded due Here, to- Here, time has expired. Our next speaker will be Jean Durgan, who will be followed by Marcy Roque. Hello. I am Jean Durgan from the Peninsula Shepherd Center, a local nonprofit providing transportation to seniors in the peninsula communities of Point Loma, Ocean Beach, and the Midway areas of San Diego. I have been with PSC for over 30 years as an employee, a board member, a volunteer, and now as a participant, as I am soon to be, be 81. PSC has provided transportation to seniors 60 and older since 1988 and now provides volunteer driver and six days a week shuttle van service. 
The PSC has been working with SANDAG on its grant program since 2006 and has received funding in every cycle except cycle 12. PSC is hoping that SANDAG will eliminate its current carve out program and return to distributing grants to small, smaller, efficient, cost effective community transportation agencies. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Marcy Rogue, and Marcy will be followed by Adriana Yamhapte. Good morning. I'm Marcy Rogue, President of Travelers Aid, and my 122 year old organization is a current and past recipient of both Senior Mini Grant and Section 5310 funding. We offer multiple programs programs that assist low-income older adults and individuals with disabilities with their transportation needs. In 2023, our senior ed program provided more than 164,000 trips throughout the entire county. Our Red Finder Mobility Management Program provided over 7,400 referrals to various programs and services and offered travel training and tra transit planning as well. I respectfully implore you to familiarize yourselves with the packet which the Coalition of San Diego Specialized Transportation Providers submitted for your review this week in preparation for today's meeting. Coalition organizations focus on the needs of the region's most vulnerable populations, and 92% of our clients are considered low income, very low income, or extremely low income by both by HUD. I urge the committee to not carve out additional funding for Ride Fact Option 4 presented today. Thank you. Your time has expired. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Adriana Yamhadpe, and uh, Adriana will be followed by Laura Shanahan. Good morning. My name is Adriana Yamhadpe, and I'm the Director of Social Services for Travelers Aid. In July 2022, I joined the CAM subcommittee led by FACT to allow for warm handoffs when referring clients to other transportation agencies. The group decided to utilize two in one's community information exchange. Since FACT kicked off the referral initiative in September 2023, Travelers Aid has not received any referrals by the CTSA through this portal. Since it launched Ride Back Now, it has denied over 31% of transportation requests. Over 3,300 requests are being picked up by other SANDAG grant recipients. It is unfortunate that clients must find this in other ways than being referred through FACS pilot program. A question of client care comes into play as well as a missed opportunity to record much needed gaps in services. I say this because, because FACT is trying to leverage their title as a CTSA to request additional funding, but the services of the CTSA are not being met. I ask that the Transportation Committee please review the letter submitted to you by the coalition. We are due to not carve out additional funding for FACT. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Shanahan, who will be followed by Dan Toda. Good morning, Transportation Committee. I'm Laura Shanahan, and I'm the Director of Operations at St. Madeline Sophie Center. We have provided transportation services to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities for over 40 years. Daily, we transport extremely low-income clients to various programs and services across San Diego County, including volunteer opportunities, vocational training, community activities, and work sites. And 17% of those are also seniors. While we also provide mobility training, due to the severity of the disabilities of those those we serve, most are not able to use traditional public transportation or even other specialized transportation to access their community. Like other nonprofits here in the coalition, we are consistently writing grants, holding fundraise events, and soliciting donations, but we've also been very thankful to receive 5310 funding um, over the years to help maintain safe and effective transportation services. We are concerned to hear that the competitive and equitable process that has been in place at SANDEC is potentially in jeopardy and could impact transportation providers like us. Therefore, we urge the committee to not adopt any carve off funding for FACT. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Toda, and Dan will be followed by Kaylee Levitt. Oh, okay. Good morning. Um, I'm here on behalf of FACT. They are essential services for San Diego County. These are, they do not limit the area. They cover from Fallbrook to San Ysidro, from Alpine to the coast, to the water. None of these other agencies, nonprofit, traveler's aid, Jewish family services, or anybody else, they limit their areas. FACT is the only one 
nonprofit organization that covers the whole county. MTS and North County Transit have a three quarter mile radius around a fixed bus route. Again, M FACT has no borders. They need to be essential services for San Diego County. And I don't understand why we even have this discussion. They should get full funding. Every one of these other agencies, Travelers Aid, Jewish Family Services, have limited areas. Thank you very much. Vouchers. Your time has expired. All right. Our next speaker will be Kaylee Levitt, and Kaylee will be followed by Christine Stensberg. Hi, thank you. Good morning. My name is Kaylee Levitt, Chief of Staff at Jewish Family Service, JFS. We provide a holistic array of services from nutrition to elder support and also family support services. Through our on-the-go program, we have provided transportation. Each one of these rides that we provide has a story. We pride ourselves in being more than a ride. Over one-third of our clients are also enrolled in some of our other services, like nutrition, minor home repairs, and social centers that help people age in place with dignity. Last fiscal year, we provided 72,000 rides, an average cost of $5.80 per ride. We are part of the coalition that you've heard today, and we urge you to look at that packet further. We are deeply concerned with the off-the-top funding considerations for FACTS operating program, Ride FACTS. Such action will significantly reduce available funding for all other specialized transportation. This will greatly impact riders, reducing and eliminating their transportation options. Picking option four will ensure competitiveness, ensure the quality of services provided, and keep efficient costs per, per trip per taxpayer dollars. We urge you to make sure to consider option four. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker will be Christine Stensberg, who will be followed by Edward Pitts. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. My name is Christine Stensberg. I'm the Senior Director of Nutrition and Aging with Jewish Family Service. Um, in addition to the on-the-go program, JFS works with these amazing organizations to coordinate transportation across the county. The core of the issue is the pie isn't big enough. We're not meeting the current demand or the future demand that we know we'll be asking for our services. Um, we talked about how FACT is the CTSA, and that contract was awarded over 17 years ago. A lot has changed in 17 years. Um, all of these processes need to be a competitive bid in order to use the limited funds as wisely as possible. Um, JFS and all of these other agencies act as unofficial CTSAs. We coordinate with each other. We meet in for meetings, we provide referrals, but yet we receive no monetary reimbursement for that. Um, please look at the consideration of lim using these limited funds as wisely as possible. Thank you. I think our next speaker is Edward Pitts, who will be followed by Paula Zili. Good morning, I'm Paula, and I'll be reading this on behalf of Edward. My name is Edward Pitts. He's sitting here behind me in the second row. I'm a 74-year-old veteran of the U.S. Air Force, and I've lived in North County for over 20 years. I suffer from multiple health issues, and I can't ride in a vehicle for extended periods of time. I rely on FACT to take me directly to all of my doctor's appointments, including the ones I have at the Naval Hospital. They're also able to take me down to San Diego, a service other local transportation options and the VA don't offer. I've been using FACT since 2019. Without them, I would not have access to my health care providers. Thank you. And Paula, did you want to make comments also? No. Oh, okay. Uh, just want to make sure, is Paula Zili, are you Paula Zili or is there a different? Okay, perfect. Just wanted to double check. Um, and then, so our next speaker will be Sophia Hughes and Sophia will be followed by Faraz Hasim. Um, my name is Sophia. I'm also a FACT employee. I'm also here to read a statement from a writer who couldn't be here today himself. Um, my name is Sam Khan. I'm severely disabled and use a power wheelchair. I found out about FACT a few months ago during a time that I was stuck without transportation. I was searching for a way to get to my medical appointments and to get back home from my girlfriend's apartment. Medical transport with, wheelch with wheelchair vans would cost over $150 each way. With FACT, I was able to get everywhere I needed to go efficiently and affordably. For me, MTS access service has been either too restrictive or unreliable. With FACT, I can book a ride just an hour in advance and go anywhere in the county. The freedom FACT provides is unimaginable. The peace of mind knowing that I can get where I need to go when I need to go there is even more valuable. 
please support FACT to make the city more accessible for people like me. I think our next speaker is Faraz Hasim, who will be followed by Arun Prem. Good morning, everyone. My name is Faraz Jassim. I'm the owner of SD Med Non-Emergency Medical Transportation. We work with multiple companies, including FACT. FACT plays a really important role in San Diego County. Uh, they service people all the way Valley Center, um, Julian, which some areas are like 20 minutes away from the nearest freeway. Um, FACT is the only service that offers on-demand service, wheelchair accessible, seven days a week. Um, we do take people to very important uh, doctor's appointments, such as dialysis. And uh, I remember a year ago, a lady called me and said, my husband has a very important doctor appointment. If he misses it, he's going to lose an eye. So please take that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Arun Prem. And after Arun, we will transition to the uh, members of the public on Zoom and start with the person ending with the phone number ending in 294. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, TC and Sandag, for this opportunity. Um, I'm Arun Prem, Executive Director of ACT. I urge the Transportation Committee to approve option one, which is a stopgap measure to provide approximately 2.3 million annually to FACT for the next two years. I also urge TC to engage the stakeholders, everybody who spoke today, and the input we received today, and uh, work with SANDAC to develop a longer term solution to this very pressing problem that we're all dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the person with the phone number ending in 294, who will be followed by the original draw. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Johnson, and I'm a writer for FACTS. And I have to tell you, I moved to California recently, and I didn't know it was available to me. I, someone told me about FACTS, and I called. And since then, I have had the ability to get to my doctor's appointments, which dialysis is three days a week, um, and doctor's appointments as well. I was using Uber and Lyft, which cost me over $60 a day. And it didn't accommodate my, my vehicle, my power chair or my scooter. I, I have to tell you, fact is viable, viable for people like me. I'm 68 years old and I have multiple disabilities. And please keep them going. The people there are great. Their staff, their call center, their drivers, they make my life bearable. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the original draw, who will be followed by Ali Servi. This is interesting because it is important to provide this, but I mean, if if a lot of this funding would go into somebody's salary and they're not providing, I mean, it's kind of going both ways with the public comment as far as um, people that agree with the service and and people that don't and feel like, you know, the money is going to be taken away from their entities to be able to provide service. And if they have a call center for referrals and they're not, you know, they're only referring certain people um, that should be looked into. So this one um, is interesting, but I think that we need to be providing service all over the county. My question is, is if this is free to the people or if they actually have a fee as well that um, they have to pay Um but uh, I think that a call center is important as well for all of these, um, you know, transportation um, services, but more of a, I don't know if people can call 211 and get information um, on all of these services, or if they literally are going to have to go online and just try and find one. We need to be providing almost like a central service location where people can call in and find service. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Ali Servi. You can go ahead. Hi, my name is Ali Servi and I'm with Travelers Aid. I have our client on the phone, Catherine Damaris. Go ahead, Catherine. Hi, my name is Catherine Damaris. I have a disability and I ride access to Travelers Aid. I got denied from my insurance. I'm in a walker. I'm 80 years old. I need the service. I need the funding for people like myself. I ride access to public 
not public transportation, but that's the only access I have. I have no car. I have no one to give me a ride. I'm in physical therapy twice a week. I was in physical therapy this week and also serve my donor child. I have medical issues every single week. I rely on access through Traveler's Aid for every medical appointment that I have. I have no else to help. I have no car. I cannot ride to keep transportation. This is why I need this needed service for Traveler's Aid through access with the funding to help people like myself. It keeps me safe. It keeps me protected. Thank you so much. Your time has expired and that concludes the public comments on this item. Great. Um, Thank you very much for all the public comments. Uh, any questions or, or uh, questions from the committee members? We are just at 12, so I hope uh, we, can, we can move this along. Let's start with uh, uh, Jules from at Epson. Epson. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question, but I'm going to save my comments for a little bit later. Um, there was a, a caller that mentioned uh, Please fund FACT because I need to ride. Will FACT still be able to operate? I mean, you showed us a screen that showed they have funding through potentially 2025 or 2026. Is that correct? So the funding they have for Ride FACT alone right now is provided through the Access for All program. That funding will end in May. They also received that cycle 12, 53, 10, that's gonna start in that same period that we think will run through the basically the fall of this year. And after that, either they compete through cycle 13 or we see what happens with them. But the guaranteed funding we know of as through today should bring it sometime into this fall, like September, October. Well, I'm sure that that will make that writer feel a little more confident. Thank you. Any other committee members? President Duncan. Um, just to be clear, because we heard some comments today, the CTSA, we're not talking about awarding any funds today for CTSA on any of these options, are we? So FACT's request included money for Ride Fact and for CTSA. So options, the option one has some CTSA funding you in there. You wouldn't know what the breakdown is approximately? Uh, it's in the report. Okay. I mean, I, I can find it. I just, because I thought we were mo like almost, ex almost exclusively not focusing on CTSA today. That was the intention. And when we reached out to FACT and asked them what their request was, they came with, with Ride Fact and CTSA dollars, because if they turn on money for Ride Fact, it also affects the brokerage and things that's happening on the CTSA. So they're kind of connected together. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll see. If you happen to find those, maybe you could let us know if we're still in discussion. Sure. I'd, I'd appreciate knowing um, that information. And again, I don't want to take a lot of time. I understand, Chair. I, I appreciate your comment. I just had a quick question. Or, uh, yes, a question. The cycle 12, I'm correct, right? ST fact was not funded through that cycle. That's part of, obviously, what has kicked off this situation. So the prior cycles, they were funded. That cycle, they were not funded. There is a cycle potentially coming up 13. Can you, if a member of the public asks me, you know, why weren't they funded in cycle 12? You know, I understand there was some rankings, then there was the other rankings, they fell right below. But that doesn't answer the question, why did they fall below? Because you said earlier, you know, we could potentially work with applicants. So when they, you know, apply in future cycles, they can maybe remedy those if factually they're competent enough, you know, they meet it. But do we, can you, I don't recall exactly why, did we, did we know or was it just the rankings from the outside parties? Surely rankings and the scores were really, really close. So it's probably just a, a number of points here and there that adjusted it. They did receive funding through cycle 12 because of a forfeiture. So their their original ask was 800,000. They're receiving about 350,000. And that money hasn't started yet. That should start next month. That's the money we think will carry them through the fall. So they do have some, but originally what led us here is they weren't competitively awarded any. 
Right, and, and I and that's my wisdom recollection, uh, recollection as well. So thank you for that, and also thank you to your work to potentially have that other interim funding or or getting actually the interim funding after the issue arose with transportation and the board. But that is really just my question: is how, is looking at working to resolve the reason I thought this was coming to resolve that that had happened and how to fix it, and then as others have stated looking in the future at, at whether other things can be done to address it. So thank you for your time. And council member, just in a nutshell, as I kick off the, the first item today, it's a, it's the total funding issue. Uh, in the cycle 12, I think we had nearly twice as many dollars asked for than we had dollars for. And I think almost all the applicants scored really well and close. So it was just tough decisions. Yeah, I don't want to go backwards too much, but if you refresh my recollection on that cycle, for instance, there were multiple, I believe, awards from that grant to MTS. Am I correct? Correct. And, and do you remember what that number was? How much? Or I don't remember off the top of my head. I just remember there was multiple. There was at least four. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And the information you're asking for what their ride fact versus CTSA. So it's on the memo. It's on page. What is this? It's 101 of the agenda. And it has two numbers. So 843,000 was the amount for ride fact and 1.5 million was the amount for CTSA. Okay. So we kind of worked those through in the options to try and when we say fully fund or partially fund, we were trying to get to those numbers in some way to make them whole. And the explanation for why that happened was that the if the ride fact is operating, it'll increase the work as a CTS. Okay. Right, on the brokerage. Thing. Thank you for that explanation. I didn't sure. know that. Thank you. Mr. Grimes. I appreciate the presentation and the uh, passion with which uh, the public uh, came to comment today. Um, I recall this one year ago uh, when we were uh, dealing with the situation with the uh, lack of uh, grant funding for uh, fact. Um, you know, my res my response was uh, due to the impact that I knew that would have on not only residents of Encinitas, but the whole San Diego County because of the type of service that they provide. All these other service providers do great things and provide a very important service, but they are more limited than the right fact. So that is one of the issues that I think uh, kind of hovers over this whole thing. Um, when uh, I was advocating that we figure out a way to um, Fun fact, I had this perhaps naive idea that the pie might get bigger, right? And that we wouldn't have to rob from Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, right? Um, clearly with these four options, uh, you know, that's, uh, it ain't getting bigger. So um, in my conversations with Arun, I, um, the idea, the, the 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 notion that maybe there was a way for him to contract more with the transit agencies came up, and Mr. Orlando mentioned that. And I wonder if MTS uh, Sharon, if you could uh, comment on whether that is at all possible through MTS as well. More contracting with. They've they've spoken to us in the past about it, um, and we use the our contractor used them during the. Um, work stoppages, um, so it has been out there. Um, we use contractors for other services. Uh, we have a contract with that we, uh, sorry, we don't have the contract with them. Um, our trans dev contract has subcontractors, so they contract with other providers as well. So that would be an option if they wanted to contract with trans dev to do that. Well, so that um, the, the mechanics of it, I don't think are, anything that, you know, I'm not gonna get involved in that, but I'm wondering if we could come up with a sort of an option five, which asked um, the, the transit agencies to, to meet with RideFact and to, um, you know, work through um, some options that might uh, provide them the, the uh, opportunities to uh, provide rides that would um, help in the current, situation. Yeah, and as we have in the past, we're 
perfectly happy to um, talk with them. Um, but ultimately, since the service provider is already contracted with TransDev, it would go through TransDev to get a contract. Well, so are you saying that they should talk to TransDev or are you saying that, that is MTS going to be at the table as well? Yeah, we'd be happy to sit with them as well. Um, but ultimately, we did a um, a full procurement through the regular procurement process in order to get our access services covered by a contractor. Um, and we have that contract in place currently. Um, so in fact, in the future, once to bid on some of our work, that would be fine. Um, but ultimately, that's... Got to go through our contracts, right? And I, I'm not suggesting that contract law be violated, but uh, maybe, maybe there are some mechanisms that could be put in place that would provide the opportunity. And uh, I didn't get into too many details with Arun, but um, I'm not too keen on option four. Um, and uh, but I am also very keen on figuring out a way to make sure that the services that they provide are widely available. So um, if there is an opportunity. Um, I would like to see that explored. So I don't know if I could make that a motion to um, um, explore a, a, a more significant relationship between RideFact and uh, MTS and NCTD mm -hmm. and come back to this committee. Um, I, I think that may be a separate item from the choices we have before us. Um, if we can take any other uh, committee members' uh, uh, points uh, before we, we actually go to a yep. motion, that would probably help. Yep. Um, Mayor White. I have no comments. Oh, I thought you were motioning to, to make a comment. Any other comments from any committee members? Um, Cusman Edson. Sure. So um, yesterday, the NCTD Board of Directors sent a letter to this committee highlighting the historic importance of TDA 4.5 funding to our agency. Bottom line, this funding is critical to maintaining NCTD's lift paratransit services, which provide vital mobility options to individuals with disabilities throughout our service area and beyond. In fiscal year 2023, Lyft provided 93,136 trips. This level of service exceeded the previous fiscal year total by 28.7%, demonstrating continued year-over-year -year growth. In what ways does NCTD's lift serve our region's disadvantaged disabled community? In lots of ways. We connect riders to the necessary, like medical care and resource centers, grocery stores, educational opportunities, and jobs. Lyft also helps improve riders' quality of life by providing rides to visit friends and family members or simply head out to enjoy leisure opportunities and activities. The mm -hmm. FTA requires that NCTD provide paratransit service. Lyft service require, requests are not refused for any reason, regardless of funding levels. TDA 4.5 is one of the few dedicated funding sources that NCTD can rely on to help fund Lyft. This essential funding supports 21% of NCTD's Lyft operating budget. Changes to the funding formula that decrease NCTD's portion of TDA 4.5 will be detrimental not only to Lyft operations, but to all NCTD transit services. Why? Because if the district's portion of TDA 4.5 funding is decreased, we will need to pull funding earmarked for other transit services to fully fund Lyft's demands. In addition to my role as NCTD's board chair, I also serve as the SANDAG appointment to the FACT Board of Directors and have for a number of years. FACT provides necessary specialized transportation services throughout our region. I have great respect for FACT's mission, which I've supported at every opportunity. I understand their budgetary needs and desire to secure a sustainable source of funding. However, taking TDA 4.5 funding away from NCTD lift and MTS access, and the vulnerable populations that they serve is not the answer. In an effort to work collaboratively with FACT and best serve our customers, NCTD has executed an MOU with FACT to provide same-day rides for Lyft customers. 
We are also exploring additional ways uh, to expand our partnership with FACT to improve paratransit operations throughout the region and to open the door to new sources of funding for FACT in furtherance of their mission. On behalf of NCTD and the disadvantaged members of the community served by Lyft, I urge the Transportation Committee to oppose any change in the formula for TDA Article 4.5 funding. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, I'm actually supportive of option number one. Um, with additional direction um, to explore uh, other relationships like with uh, MTS and NCTD. Uh, FACT is the only one that actually covers the entire county. And so um, the others that were funded, they do not cover the areas that are very, very critical, especially in North County. So we, have, we would have zero um, services that people relied on for the last few years. And this is this is really really hard. I I understand the the idea of of trying to fill maybe gaps within say the more urban the more the metropolitan areas, but then in, in terms of equity, there's a whole lot a whole population up in North County um, that is completely left out completely. So um, I listening to everyone obviously uh, for me. There were certain equity criteria that were not included um, in the actual process, um, which resulted in what 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 ended up happening. In fact, being completely, um, you know, well, not picked for funding. So for for me, it is critical to get that funding back. Um, for people who are relying on it, uh, uh, dialysis, uh, medical appointments, um, getting food. I mean, these are very, very, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 re that transportation they rely on for their mere existence and to be able to, to live, you know, to be able to live through. So I would... My motion would be to go with option one, but with direction to staff that we especially um, for the second fiscal year, that uh, we find ways to try to um, see how we can work with NCTD or MTS to lessen that load, maybe spread the spread the spread the funds um, around to the other um, to the other applicants. I'll second that. So I have a motion uh, by Sanchez and seconded by White. Any other discussion? Uh, as well as, uh, right. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate the presentation um, and Sandag staff's effort to find a path forward. Um, unfortunately, I think that every option before us today raises just as many questions as answers. Um, if we dedicate a portion of federal 5310 funding to fact, other agencies that uh, compete for this funding um, and do very good work would essentially lose out. Um, alternatively, if we dedicate a portion of TDA funding to fact, we'll be shortchanging our transit agencies who also provide a critically, uh, a critical and federally mandated um, service. So therefore, um, I don't think we should have moved forward with option number one or any of these options, to be honest with you. Um, I do think we should seek additional funding for specialized transportation. Uh, perhaps a bigger pie will be easier to divide. But right now, I don't have the confidence that choosing any of these options makes sense, basically. Um, so I will be voting against um, the motion on the floor, and I would urge my colleagues to do the same. Uh, with that, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, let's go with Duncan and, and then Sanchez. Thank you. And I apologize because I did ask some questions earlier and I didn't give these comments because on other boards I serve, they have to do the questions and discussion comes afterwards. So I'll just briefly add my discussion comments. I'm also going to um, support option one. And I understand all the comments about, you know, it is a finite amount of money that's moved around. But I firmly believe from everything that I've I've read and, and saw all the way back to our prior meetings on this here and on the board of directors on this issue, that FACT should have been funded in that cycle. 
if you take that to be something that you believe you know should have happened, if fact was funded, then not this money that other potential entities are concerned about missing out on. Not I'm not talking about the, the governmental agencies, but the the other applicant that if they were awarded their the funding as they had been in the past, we would be at that same playing field now. The purpose with the, how this got here to me is trying to get back to where facts should have been funded. I understand that's maybe easy for me to say or assume. Others may disagree, but it's one of the most valuable services I believe we have in this county for our handicapped uh, individuals. The um, I have not heard uh, from anyone that uh, fact would not serve any of those customers. So when you say, hey, you're taking it away from this valuable population who won't be served now if you move this money, that's not true if they actually are served by fact subsequently. They're not going to not be served. Um, yeah. I think fact is a broader service. Part of our job when we spend money, obviously, is to do it in the most efficient fashion and rides to me that cross long county distances from south county to north county east county to the coast and back without having to change vehicles is the most efficient way to do it um this is uh, a painful i understand one off but you know when you look at helping these people i mean yesterday a study came out that said of high school graduates that are not prepared and eligible to apply to Cal State schools or to UCs. Handicapped children were in that group as the top two foster kids and handicapped kids as not having been able to be prepared with the proper classes to even apply to a Cal State or a UC school. You know, I know our chair of our board focuses heavily on youth opportunity passes. This is to me, somewhat analogous with helping that most vulnerable population. So those are my comments. Thank you. Mayor Kranz. I'm not able to support the motion. Um, I served nine years on the NCTD board and and uh, I think that to vote for this motion without uh, an in-depth analysis of the impacts on the transit agencies is, is uh, uh, I'm not sure what the best adjective would be, but it's not good. Um, and so my preference would be to go the route that put fact together with the transit agencies to see if there are ways, see, to get creative, to figure out how to provide fact the uh, necessary uh, resources that they would need and do that through providing services. So um, I just don't think, uh, you know, dropping the hammer at this time is is the right way to go. So um, working harder to grow the pie, I'm trusting that uh, staff understood that their mission was to figure out a way to get this done. I don't think anybody put limits on where they could go to find the money to do that. It, no, right, right. So um, I, I don't think that's the option, but I do think that before we go to option one, we should ask um, ride fact and and the transit agencies to get together. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Very briefly, that was going to be one of my questions. Without belaboring the point, is the collateral impacts within CTD and MTS? How do they absorb this hit if there's a reduction in finance and still being able to maintain that level of service? So that would be my question: Is that information could be very valuable to come up with a, an equitable solution so that we are covering our clientele without the county? Thank you. So on these, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, really quick, since I don't actually have a vote on this one, I'll just encourage my colleagues to think of I'm listening to what I heard from the presentation. Is my understanding was when we gave direction to this last year uh, to look into this, that it was to figure out how to make the hole that was created by the grant. And you said the grant application was for eight hundred thousand dollars, correct? Of which three hundred and fifty some has already been. Funded, So I have a real problem with option one in the sense that it suddenly ballooned into something much larger than what the original investigation was even intended to be. Um, you know, I, I think it's really fine to look into our original charter of, okay, our original request of how do we fill this grant, but now we've actually created a whole 
sort of shadow outside of the box way for someone to come in and say, oh, let's let's get our full uh, agenda published and, and funded um, besides what was just put in before the grant. And I understand logically why that happened, but it feels really uncomfortable to me. And it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable about this board potentially going ahead and approving option one. Um, otherwise, uh, since we haven't been able to find additional funding, um, I do think that, you know, we, we drafted a process which was very transparent, which was very clear in how to follow, and the board should stick with what that process was, which was the outcome of the grant allocations last year, uh, without additional funding actually having been, be, been identified, which I had thought was sort of the, the intent of this exercise. And it's turned into versus additional funding, just pulling money from certain agencies and allocating them somewhere else. And that's a really... That's a path I would encourage us not to go down to in this in this type of uh, process and environment. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Zito. Mayor Sanchez, you have a comment. Final comments. Uh, in October, the, the 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 discussion was about the unfairness of the process, not just you know the the result, the result, and then what happened. So um, I just want to say that the, that the motion on the floor. Um, we'll give opportunities to the board and to staff to find other sources of funding, obviously, and and also with that direction of working with the other NCTD and and uh, um, MTS to find ways to lessen that load. So I am encouraging um, board members here to consider that whole whole places in North County in other areas will be completely left out. Thank you. asking for a clarification of the motion because it sounded like you said you wanted option one yeah so i can't go there thanks yeah the, the motion is for uh, current motion is uh, for option uh one um uh, jenny or staff can you put up um the f option two and three for me and as you do so i'll just mention uh my concerns um i obviously hear the concerns about uh uh, the, the less funding for our two transit operators, MTS and, 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 and NCTC. Um, and I'm also very cognizant of how we may be uh, reducing the amount of money for all these other great uh, nonprofit organizations that provide services in our, our county that have been, that are supported by many volunteers and have very um, uh, special um, clients. And, and I say, clients because that's the difference for these nonprofit organizations um, who they serve are not uh, riders but are clients uh, because they provide a full gamut of services other than just uh, transportation uh, so because of that uh, I'm really leery of um, a, a large amount of uh, funding being taken away from the competitive process which I believe Sandag originally set out so that we could be objective but it's not always perfect, right? And, and, and particularly when we don't have enough money. Um, and, and I really don't like the idea of um, uh, of us having to, to deal with this when we don't see grant applications with details, uh, without looking at them and spending hours. Uh, we don't have that ability here at this uh, committee. And really, we don't have that expertise either. Uh, so, so what I'm gonna propose as a substitute motion is I'm looking at option, um, uh, this is three, and the amount that would go to um, FAC, which I believe, I, I hear everyone's concerned about, let's give FAC some uh, some funding so that they can operate throughout the county and provide their services. This is a grant amount. Uh, if it was a grant, it would be, exceed what they applied for in the previous cycle. Is that correct? Slightly. So it's, it's close to it's or a close little to what they would have requested and probably with a little bit of inflation. Right. And option three um, does not affect, uh, it's still 2%. Correct. Does not touch the TDA allocation at all. Right. So that the transit operators will be okay. It. I think, Jenny, I, I bet this is, you, you gave us this option to give us a compromise. <laughs> Trying um, to. <laughs> you tried to. And it meets some of the concerns I just uh, heard about helping the transit operators, making sure FAC gets enough funding uh, to, to move forward. Um, the only addition I would 
add to option three is that we um, advocate or ask that the transit operators consider uh, contracting with FACT uh, for their services that may come down the road. I know there's many other things involved with that. So that's probably not, well, it doesn't have to be part of the motion. So, so I'll just make a substitute motion uh, rather than option one, we go with option three uh, to address the concerns we have given. As part of that though, um, I don't believe FACT should be a, a, a competitor in the competitive grants for uh, 5310 uh, because if they are guaranteed 26% um, uh, of that grant, grant fund, which exceeds what they would have gotten in the last cycle, uh, they shouldn't be a, a applicant yeah, either uh, with the remaining grant funds. Uh, so that's, I think, the criteria you ask for each uh, um, option. So it's option three, with fact not being a applicant for the remaining uh, grant funds in 5310, um, and the request for the transit operators, I'll keep that out of the motion. Would fact, so 5310 has mobility management and operating. So with this option, you're funding just ride fact, which is operating. Could fact still compete for 5310 for mobility management funding? That's a different piece of it that's not addressed in here. So explain, uh, just so that we're clear, the one is for operating, and the other other grant portion from 310 is for uh, facilities or so management. I'm this sorry. would fund ride fact. The other portion of 5310 is for those CTSA activities, the brokerage, the working with other providers on call center and those sorts of things. It's not connected to this directly for funding. Was so this that, would make them whole on the last right, cycle. Right. Uh, would, would, was that the intent in CTA operation with the TDA funds? On options one and two, yes, but on this one, it's not. This is just to fully fund ride fact, the original request that you gave to us. On option two, you had a percentage for a uh, five percent on uh, from TDA funds. Yes, uh, increasing from two percent. Uh, there was an additional three, and that would have been for operating funds. It would have been operating and mobility management. Mobility management. I'm sorry, just uh, so. Um, point I'm, of clarification, we are 30 minutes past our time, so if we could move on with uh, the votes, I will. Um, I'm sorry, I have to uh, amend my uh, my own motion, so if I could restate my motion again. Uh, so let's use the pie chart on 5310 from option three and the pie chart on ADA funds from option uh, two which would in increase uh, the, the, uh, the CTA type funding. Uh, so that would be a, somewhat of a, a cut from the two transit agencies, but I think it's a small amount increasing from 2% to 3-5%. And then adding, as you previously added, that they are not eligible to apply for the Correct. next Correct. Because because they're, the they're, cycles that are in existence during that period. Yeah, they would already get that. So that's my substitute motion. Chair, could I ask a question? Um, your original motion and the slide for um, option three, can we amend the 26% where it would go to? Can it both be operations and can it be amended to cover both rather than eating into TDA funds? That dollar amount could be used I mean, 5310 gives us that flexibility. So this was just trying to kind of attach it to something. You could use it for both pieces, for mobility management and ride back. Could, could I ask a clarifying question? Has legal determined that these are legal, legally allowed procurements? I mean, you're basically giving a sole source contract to fact. So on the 5310 component, uh, FTA regulations don't require a competition. The recipient or the right. SANDAG right. could require a competition, but we're not required to. And, and, and is that, does that answer your the, question? Yeah. It, well, the, the TDA funds would require rule change that the board can, would have to make when, when we get to if if this motion passed and we needed to get uh, move from two percent to five percent on the TDA funds, I believe that would be a 
Is that a rule change at the board level? Yes, there'd have to be a change to board policy 27. So TC's action today would be a recommendation to make that board policy change, and that would need to go through the process of executive committee making a recommendation to the board and the board then adopting it. But this all is just a recommendation to the board as well. So. Great. So I'll second it for purposes of moving forward. If your motion is complete as you've stated it. Thank you. Um, so we have a substitute motion. I need to move forward because Councilman Moran was ready to leave. So the substitute motion, um, just for the record, can you restate the, the motion for us? Uh, I was going to ask you to restate the motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me restate the motion. Uh, the pie chart on option three for uh, one, uh, one, uh, uh, five, five, ten, and the pie chart on option two for TDA funds, which is uh, reducing, uh, in increasing the um, uh, funds for, t uh, for the CTA to 5% from its current level of 2%, uh, and that um, FAC would not be able to compete for the competitive grants in uh, 5310. Does that cover all the I I issues? Yes, yeah, so, and what are we limiting FAC from competing? On? 5310. Uh, all of the 5310 other yeah. than what the carve out is? Yeah, during this period of funding. During, during this cycle. Okay, cycle 13. Right. That clear to everyone? So, so I have a, a motion made by me and seconded by Duncan. Let's vote on a substitute motion uh, first. Shani's not here, she left. Substitute motion fails. Let's go to the um, original motion. Is there any other discussion on the original motion? Did we see that? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so let's go on to um, the original motion uh, for uh, option one only. Um, and there was one part of that. Uh, did you want uh, FIAC to be eligible for the grant funding? That was not part of, I didn't hear that as part of the motion. Okay, okay, so let's vote on. Uh, yeah, and just so option one does note that they would not be able to compete for funding um, through cycle 13. Right. Right. <laughs> So just move along with fail, the, that motion failed. I'd like to move on. Is there any other uh, motions to be made on Your mic is not on. Your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. So that motion failed. Is there any motion to move forward on this item? Uh, just that you know that if we don't take an action uh, today, Jenny, do we revert back to uh, what we have for essentially option uh, four? Uh, I'll make a, a motion for option three. That's what we just kind of had, but. Come, come, right. So we have a motion to go with option three. I'll uh, second it. And seconded by uh, Duncan. We're ready to vote. Any other discussion? If we're ready to vote, this option okay. three is on the table. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Duncan, you didn't say about whether or not they're eligible to, uh, to uh, co compete for grants. Is your motion? No, no, no. This is slightly different. Option motion. three. I don't remember Option what. Three with both pie charts and three, so no impact on the grants and agency. May I ask a question of the motion seconded. maker? Would you want the fifty-three ten to be able to be used for either of the purposes of FAC? Yes. Okay. So amending in that way. Okay. Can you re restate that option three. Option three. That would be flexible. With the funding, with with funding, and uh, and are they eligible? Basically, to, they have to offer. Are they eligible to gr apply for additional grants? Though I don't remember what the uh, what the um, recommendation was. 
I mean, I'm looking at option three, and she made a motion for option three, and I seconded it. So I think it speaks okay. for itself. I okay. mean, if we have questions, that's fine. But I don't know what question you're asking. All right, let's me. go ahead and vote for option three as yeah. it's pre been presented by staff. Okay, but flexible. But I think the other motions had that that caveat that you couldn't apply, and so we're just leaving that out, and they can apply for the next right, that was, funding. That was much less funds, right? So. Yes. I don't I don't remember what the option was. I closed out my Yeah. I, I think as it was presented to us, they could still apply. I right, still uh, for, apply. For okay. So it's going to because be straight out the, option uh, three. If I can still apply for additional grant funding. Um yes. and and but the T, uh, the other funding. We're only talking about okay. a little bit of money. So yeah. so let me before we go on to voting again, let's make it real clear. Option three, they can apply for grants uh in the uh, uh fifty three uh then funds, and but they're flexible in terms of how they spend that yes. money as well. Okay. Option three. Okay, so that's that's option three. recommendation. And mm -hmm. so please vote. Uh, so that motion does pass uh, with six yeses and two noes and two absences. Thank you all for participating uh, through that process and getting us uh, to a re resolution. Um, and we now have that uh, item done. Uh, with that, our next transportation committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, March 15th at 9 a.m. Um, um, we are adjourned. Thank you. Was going to make them home. If that's what the issue was.